So we're ready to go. Uh, and I'd like to take that question before we. Okay. Before we... So my question is, um, there's a blue arrow to the right next to Lee. What is that? A blue it's a circle arrow to the right. I'm to the sorry? right next to uh, Lee's uh, picture. Ah, you must be in um, uh, gallery view where you're seeing all of us at one time. Yeah, well, I did it this yeah. morning, but there's, I see you, of course, I see Lee and myself. How do I go? Uh, I, 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 are you on, are you on a, sorry. I take it you're on a computer. No, a laptop. Uh, yeah, a laptop. A, yeah, there's a an computer, arrow. a laptop, or a desktop computer, as opposed to a phone yeah. or a tablet. This, now, what there. that blue arrow over there is telling you is that there are more people in the meeting I that. than will fit on that one screen. Sure. So if I click on it, I see more people then? Yep, exactly. Because when I was teaching, I didn't dare to touch it. When I was teaching uh, yes, yesterday morning, because I didn't want to uh, lose and you, my students. So you saw that then. OK, yeah, you had a lot of I people did. in there then. Yeah. OK, so, well, that's all that is. That won't okay. knock you out of the meeting or anything. That just allows you to see everybody else. Thank you so much. And how do I go to God? Because I, um, yeah, one more question. There well, no, I, I promised one. From now on, okay. I'm going to ask you to put questions in the chat. Okay, now we've got everyone muted. If we can keep the, uh, remember, if you've got your mic open, we'll all hear anything that's going on in the room with you. So um, if you wouldn't mind keeping that muted, and let, let's talk just a little bit about some basics of Zoom, attending a Zoom meeting so that uh, you'll know how to manage your audio and get to the chat tool and so on. On a computer, if you mouse over where you're seeing me, you should see a menu pop up at the bottom of the screen. Or on a mobile device, a phone or a tablet, if you tap the screen, you should see the menus come up. In the lower left is a little mute button. It's, it looks like a microphone. And if you, and right now it should have a red slash through it indicating that you are currently muted. If you want to speak, you have to click on that button and take that red slash away, and then you'll be able to speak. With this many, with 71 people now in the meeting, we're not going to be able to do that for everybody throughout the meeting. I'm sorry, it's just, we never get anything done. So, and, and it'd just be a chaos. So I'm going to keep you muted most of the time. And I'm also going to ask you to put your questions that I promise you I will answer into the chat tool. The chat tool is also in that uh, Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer, a laptop or a desktop computer. Your, um, you can see the chat tool about halfway across the menu it is a little cartoon balloon. And if you click on that cartoon balloon, a little box will pop up that has the chat log in it. People typing messages and sending them to everyone. And that's a very important tool in a live Zoom session. You will um, note at the very bottom of the chat box is a little text box that uh, says type message here. And you can type something in there and press enter and everyone will see it. And it, we'll be able to save that chat log as we go through the meeting and keep a record of that. So if information is pa placed in there that you will need later, it's possible to save that so you can refer back to it later. But with, in a meeting with, what are we up to now, 73 people in the meeting, the chat tool becomes a critical tool because it's really the only way we can affect it, that you can effectively communicate back with me because there are just too many people in the meeting at one time. So I need something I can go back through when we get to the question and answer period at the end of the session. 
Uh, but I'm going to try to leave the leave you the option to unmute yourself. Mainly at this point, we'll have to reserve that sort of thing for something going wrong, like suddenly you can't hear me anymore, or I'm talking about something that obviously I'm expecting you to see and you can't see it, <laughs> or something. If you're if it's something like that, please let me know immediately. Uh, otherwise, we're probably going to have to keep the uh, back and forth to the end of the of the session with this many people. And, uh, I, I regret that, but there's not much I can do about it. All righty, so we're all uh, we're all muted now. Oh, and uh, for those of you attending on your phones and your tablets. The chat tool is not in that menu at the bottom of your screen. When you tap the screen, it is under the participants tool that is in that menu. If you tap where it says participants, you'll see the chat tool in the lower left-hand corner of the participants window. The participants window just shows you everyone who's in the meeting. But it also, on a, port on a mobile device, a smartphone, a tablet, an iPad, it will uh, allow you to get to the chat tool as well. Okay, so we've got the, some basics out of the way there. Um, the first thing I'd like you to do in the chat tool, if you wouldn't mind, and I, I saw some of you have anticipated me and already done it, but uh, just to make sure you can get to the chat tool and you can use it, and to give me an idea of who is here tonight, if you wouldn't mind going to the chat tool and typing your name and your email address in there. So I'll have a record of who attended and I'll have a way to get back in touch with you if you have a question that I can't answer tonight and I need to, to get back to you on it. And I'm certain that some of you can ask questions that I can't answer. I learned something new about Zoom in every one of these meetings, so don't feel bad about asking, because none of us know everything about Zoom. It has unanticipated capabilities sometimes. And I see that pouring through. Thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it. You're a great audience, as uh, Jimmy Kimmel says. <laughs> Yeah, Jimmy Kimmel's reduced his using Zoom too right now. So let's go ahead and get started with the presentation. It's not going to be very formal, but it will be a presentation. Um, let's talk first about what you can and you can't do with Zoom. You can interact dynamically just as if you were in a classroom with your students. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool for that. It's terrific for engaging students, even in a fully online course where students normally never see one another or the instructor, a little bit of Zoom can really help build rapport between the instructor and the students and among the students. It's a wonderful tool, even in a fully online course, which is normally mostly asynchronous and, and taught in Canvas. But Zoom is available to you to spice that up. So it's a terrific tool in that regard. So you can, you can interact with your students, you can hold office hours, help sessions, even in a fully online course. But in our current situation, Zoom is a lifeline for us because it allows us to at least initially continue teaching our courses in much the way that we did our face-to-face -face courses in much of the way that we did before this crisis landed upon us. You can use Zoom to lecture just about as effectively as you can do in a physical classroom. Indeed, I would argue that under many circumstances, it's more effective than a physical classroom in imparting knowledge to your students in real time. Uh, there's almost nothing you can't do in a real classroom or a, 
in a physical classroom that you, that you can't do in Zoom with a little ingenuity and maybe a couple of extra little uh, devices. You do, if you're originating a Zoom session with your students, you really do need a, mic, a, um, uh, a webcam or some equivalent thereof to, in order for your students to be able to see you. And the webcam should have, you should either have microphones in the webcam, most of them do, or a separate microphone so your students can hear you. Otherwise, you're not really going to be, a, you're not going to be able to use Zoom. Not without the microphone anyway. You could get along without the webcam, but not without the microphone. Um, so that's kind of a minimum expectation. You can use Zoom from a computer, a laptop, or a desktop, but you can also use it from mobile devices like smartphones and tablets. And many of your students, in fact, are going to be attending your Zoom meetings on their smartphones. And the good news about that is that Zoom works ex especially well um, on a smartphone for a participant. And in a pinch, <laughs> you can even run your class from a smartphone. I don't recommend it as a regular thing, but I have had to do it when my internet connection at home has gone down. I'm, I'm living up here in Northern Idaho, and sometimes the, uh, the, the, uh, the boreal influences do not align and my internet connection goes down and uh, I've had to run classes like this one from my phone. It's not for the faint of heart but it can be done. And we'll talk as much as we can tonight about uh, using Zoom with portable devices with smartphones and tablets. Oh. So just some background information on what you can do with Zoom. What you can't do really with Zoom is test your students, ass assess your students' progress. It's really a communication tool, not an assessment tool. You can't have students turn in homework to you over Zoom like you can in the physical classroom. That's one lack in it. And you uh, and students can't communicate with one another on their own time asynchronously, we say, through Zoom, unless they have their own Zoom account. By the way, let's clear up that misconception that some people have right now. Your students do not have to have a Zoom account in order to attend your Zoom meetings. Only the host has to have a Zoom account. Make sure that gets heard. So your students can come into your meetings as long as they have a device that they can connect to the internet that has Zoom capability on it, which includes just about any smartphone, tablet, or any kind of computer. But these things that you can't do with Zoom, assessment and asynchronous communication, are beautifully handled by Canvas. So a remote, a paradigm for remote instruction, an ideal paradigm, I should say, for remote instruction is live lectures like this, where you engage with your students in real time, complemented by resources uh, and assessments and, and um, asynchronous communication opportunities hosted on Canvas. So to do a really good job in remote instruction like this, you need both Zoom and Canvas. And of course, this morning we did a Canvas overview. We've got several more this week. You always have an op opportunity to do that, or to come in and listen to that. So let's start with the nitty gritty of Zoom here. You, if you're going to originate and host a meeting, do need a Zoom account. And you can get one, a pro account, one with all the bells and whistles on it, for free, courtesy of the State Chancellor's Office, uh, managed through CCC Confer, the State uh, Community College Conferencing Organization. Uh, if you have not already requested such an account, you want to do so right away. 
And I'm going to show you how to do that first thing. Let's see, I am recording. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> for those of you I might not I might not have met in the past, I'm Dave Giberson. I was formerly a the senior online uh, online instructional coordinator at uh, Online Learning Pathways. I've since retired. Now I'm just a senior citizen living in Northern Idaho, and they've asked me to come back to help. At least it's a lot safer than, than if I were a doctor and going back into a hospital to help. So I'm counting myself lucky. <laughs> so I'm glad to meet those of you I haven't met before, and it's wonderful to see those of you who are returning. So how do you get your Zoom account your free Zoom Pro account if you haven't already done so. To show you that, I'm gonna to have to share my screen, which is Zoom's superpower. I can share my screen so that you all see what I'm seeing on my monitor in front of me. Think of yourself sitting in a classroom with your laptop hooked up to a projector. What I'm about to do is analogous to the projected image on the wall, behind me in a physical classroom, except that everybody will be able to see it clearly, especially even the people in the back of the room can see it clearly. Uh, so let me do that. Let me share my screen. You're now looking at, uh, let's see, that's, this is not stuff I mean, I need to worry about. There's my desktop. Anything that I bring over onto this desktop, you will be able to see. Anything that appears on this screen here, you will be able to see. So let me pull up a new Zoom or a new Chrome window, I should say. To get your um, free Zoom account, you want to go, you want a web to confer Zoom dot org and let me put that up so you can see it a little better i know that's a little small especially for those of you working on a, uh, a mobile device a phone but on the phone you have a capability that you may not know that you can use in zoom of zooming your screen in so you can zoom in on smaller print or smaller objects that I'm showing you on the screen, you should just be able to, to put your thumb and uh, for an index finger on the, uh, on the screen and spread them apart and zoom in. And then you can use one finger to move that image around so that you can see different parts of the screen. So even on a smartphone, it is possible to see the screens that are shared by the host quite well if you zoom in. But here's confer zoom and i seem to have this zoomed in already let me see yep <laughs> let's bring that back to regular size there we go i was just using the uh, zoom uh, options in uh, a standard web browser to control plus and minus will uh, will zoom in and out of the screen in case you were wondering all right so let's go to conferzoom.org. Let me give you that in a little bit larger print. There it is. And I'll put that in the chat tool as well so that you'll have it for later. Okay, it's in the chat tool. And here's where you go. This is the Confer Zoom website. There's a sign up button in the lower left. Click that. You get a form to fill out here. Fill out that form. When you're asked for an email, give them, you have to give them your district account, your .edu account. So your Confer Zoom account will be linked to your um, district email then just fill out everything else and click sign up there are humans involved in this fulfillment process and those humans are slammed right now <laughs> they've been they've been going flat out for three weeks 
making uh, these confer Zoom accounts for people all over the state. Uh, right now, they, I think they're saying that it may be 72 hours before you get your account back. I've heard of a lot of I've heard from a lot of people whose wait has been much shorter than that, even to a few minutes. But I've heard from people who had to wait longer. So get that request in as soon as possible. Um, if you don't already have a confer Zoom account, and they will get you fixed up. Alrighty. And you will need that pro account. You can start with a free Zoom account that you can get at zoom.us. And these are the same accounts that you can get from Confer Zoom, except that if you don't pay for it here, it will have limitations. It'll be a free account and it'll have limitations. The main limitation on a free account is that your meetings can only last 40 minutes. That's not as problematic as it might sound because you can just start another meeting and go another 40 minutes, but um, that's a little disruptive. So you really want, and there are other things that you can do with a pro account that you can't do with a regular account, though not that much. You can share your screen in a free Zoom account. Uh, you can do most of the things you can do in a pro account with a free account, but it's just less, you have fewer configuration options and so on. It's just a less um, uh, powerful thing. And you, you want all the power you can get in this Zoom. So do start, get that confer Zoom account as quickly as you can. If you, um, let me log out here. If you want to sign up for a free account, you can do that right here on the Zoom website. But don't use, well, actually you can use your district email address to sign up for this. And if you do that, when they get your confer Zoom account working, your the account that you've signed up for will actually just automatically be converted to a pro account. And you can always tell if it's a pro account because if I sign in here at Zoom, that's my confer Zoom uh, login, and click on yourself up here. If, if the account says licensed, it's a pro account. If it says free, it's not. Okay, so signing up for a confer Zoom uh, account. And if you haven't done that, you want to do that as soon as you can. Okay, so let's say you have a Zoom account. Now what? <laughs> How can you use it with your students? Well, the first thing you need to know how to do is how to start a Zoom meeting. And unfortunately, they, there are a bewildering variety of options to, on how to do that. I'm going to show you one straight path <laughs> that will work every time. It's not the only way to do this, but it's the way I found to be least confusing and most reliable in ending up with a situation where you and your students are in the same Zoom meeting room and able to engage with one another. So what I like to do, and you can do this with a confer Zoom account or with a free Zoom account. They, they're really all handled by the company uh, Zoom. And they're all, they can all be accessed in the same place. Uh, again, let's start and let me log myself out here so I can show you how this works from the beginning. First thing I do when I go to create, to start a Zoom account is I web to zoom.us. Let me put that in the chat tool. And it's not www.zoom.us, though that will work. All you have to type is zoom.us. 
not .com or .edu or .net uh, uh, or anything like that. Zoom uses the .us top level domain, which is obviously United States. They were one of the first people I ever saw use that. So you go to zoom.us and this screen loads. I'm assuming here that you've already received your confer Zoom or your free Zoom account, one or the other, and you have your login credentials, which will be the email address associated with the account or user ID and a password that you have either been given or have set up yourself. So you can sign in using those credentials right here on the top bar of the Zoom website, sign, where it says sign in. You click on that and you get to a standard login screen. You put the email, your email address that you used when the Zoom account was created. And you put in the password, which um, was given to you or you created and you click sign in. You may want to stay signed in. You click sign in and you go into your confer Zoom account pages at zoom.us. This works equally well if this is a confer Zoom account or a free Zoom account. You can operate them the same way. They're really all Zoom accounts. They're all handled pretty much the same way. To start a meeting, I strongly recommend that you use what's called your personal Zoom meeting room. This is a room whose access credentials never change. The link to your Zoom room, the ID, meeting ID for your personal Zoom room never change unless you get a new Zoom account. This way, everybody always ends up in the same Zoom meeting room. The only time I've ever seen Zoom fail for people is when the, the meeting host, you, end up in one Zoom meeting room and the attendees, your students, end up in another. And that can happen all too easily. We had a lot of trouble with that when we first started using Zoom years ago. And that convinced me to just stick with the procedure that I'm about to tell you about. Uh, you can, uh, on your uh, Zoom meetings page, which is where you get dropped automatically, normally, but if not, you can just click on the word meetings on the left here and bring this page up. If you go across the top of the screen here, you'll see a link to the, your personal meeting room. This is yours alone. And if you click on that, you'll see a personal meeting ID, which is a, what, a 10 digit number. And you see a personal join URL. Mine's been customized. Yours won't look like that. Yours will look something like this where it ends with a bit with a number, which happens to be the same thing as the meeting ID. I wish I hadn't customized mine for a variety of reasons, but I did. And I can't figure out how to uncustomize it. <laughs> so I'll figure it out someday when I have time. Um, so you I always use my personal Zoom meeting room for my meetings. For that reason, the access information never changes. That's why Mary was able to send out a message, an email to you all with my Zoom link in it and say, just click here for all the meetings. That's, all of them are gonna be held in this same room. It's like having your own physical classroom that no one else gets to use. How many of us have had that experience? Not often. But with Zoom, you get that experience. This is your meeting room, nobody else can use it. And the room number, if you will, the meeting ID or the access link never change. So you can supply that access link and or that meeting ID to your students 
and they always use the same one so they can always get into your meetings no matter when they are um, or whatever's happening by accessing that same using that same meeting id or meeting link so how, what does this have to do with starting the meeting well in your personal meeting room page in your meetings tab on the zoom website you will see a blue button up in the upper right hand corner let me move that over a little bit i know some of you on mobile devices have a little video window up in that corner which is difficult to get rid of so i'm going to move this away so that that's not covering up what i'm about to talk about uh, and i'm i'm looking over at my own cell phone here to inform that so i'm trying to take care of those of you who are attending on mobile devices because remember your students the majority of your students may well be using their phones to access your zoom meeting good news is they can do it that, that that works really well but the bad news is you got to take into account some of the limitations on the mobile device but the button i'm interested in here is this one and right now it says join now that's because i'm in a meeting <laughs> it's asking me if i want to join another a different one if you have not started a meeting this will say start meeting so that's what you're looking for, the start meeting button. So you can just click that start meeting button and in you will go. Your meeting will begin and it'll be exactly the same process you went through when you got into this meeting tonight. You'll, uh, you'll have to tell Zoom it's okay to open the Zoom meeting link and then you will have to um, tell Zoom how you want to handle your audio, which will usually be uh, com uh, use computer audio, or you may be using a telephone for audio access to Zoom, though usually not as the host, I hope. But you answer that question for Zoom, and then you're dumped into the meeting, and you can proceed. And that's the easiest, most straightforward way to start a Zoom meeting. And that ensures that you start your Zoom meeting in your personal meeting room, rather than in some other randomly generated meeting room, which is what can happen if you just go up here to the um, uh, link in the Zoom, on the Zoom webpage that says host a meeting. If you do that, it may or may not use your personal meeting room depend on, depending on how you have your Zoom settings configured. But if you use this button here that will say start meeting, I guarantee you, you'll be starting a meeting in your personal meeting room. And the access information that you've given to your students will be valid and they will be able to join you. As I say, there are other ways to do this. An experiment by all means, but you do wanna be sure that, the, that you end up in the same place as your students. Okay. Uh, so this personal meeting room is a meeting room in Zoom whose access information never changes. The meeting ID, the join URL never change. So you can provide that meeting ID and your, the join URL to your students in a variety of different ways, and they can get into your meeting with a minimum of hassle and no risk of them ending up in one meeting room and you in another. So this is how I recommend you start a meeting. So you have your meeting running. I got a good question here I wanna answer right now. Do you have to schedule a meeting? You don't have to, no. You can just start a meeting anytime. You do, however, have to let your students know <laughs> when you're gonna be online and how to get into your meeting. And that's the next thing I wanna talk about. How can, you, how can you provide your students access to your Zoom meetings? So if we've gotten the idea of how to get a Zoom meeting going in your personal meeting room, now let's talk about how you can get that information to students. 
One way is just to have get the information to your students the same way you got this information on how to attend my meeting tonight. You can just send them an email. Uh, you can bring up your Outlook, District Outlook. Bring that over here. And you can just, um, well, actually, probably not use Outlook. That's gonna, not going to be convenient for you now that I think about it. You could send your students a meeting through your uh, email tool in the portal, in your roster. But that thing's kind of kind of cranky, too, and kind of complex. Would what I recommend you do, yes, uh-huh. Would the inbox be easier? That's exactly where I'm going. Okay. Okay. Uh, so probably I would recommend using the, your inbox in can your inbox tool in Canvas. Exactly. Very good. Uh, let me find Canvas here. I've got it open somewhere. There it is. I'm just in a dem demonstration Canvas course here. In Canvas, you have an inbox tool which is basically an email tool uh, through which you can send your students uh, emails, both in their Canvas inboxes and in their personal email inboxes. So this will reach them wherever they are. You can go in, you can start a message. You'll have to select the course that you are using. Come on, Canvas. This is unusually twitchy for Canvas. I don't, come on, there we go. Let me find a course inbox tool that has some students in it. You can decide, you can choose whom to send this tool for to, or whom to send this information to, your students. Probably you're gonna send it to all your students. And you can just say, Zoom meeting in the subject line. Probably help to spell your credibility to spell Zoom right. <laughs> and you can say um, Zoom meeting, something to the effect of Zoom meeting, uh, say 325 at 2 p.m. Here's the link to access the meeting. And then you go back to Zoom. Let's see, here I am. Bring it back over for a second. And access your account screens and go to your meetings tab and your personal meeting room and copy this join URL. Come on, Windows. There we go. To your clipboard. Then go back to your mess your uh, your message here, and just paste that in. And your students, when they receive this email, can wait till two p.m. tomorrow, and they just click on that link and access your Zoom meeting. And they'll go into the right Zoom meeting because that link has your, that is your personal meeting room link. Or you can just give them the meeting ID. That makes it a little bit more complicated for them. But my meeting ID is that. That's also on the same screen in Zoom where you found the join URL. 
just up above it. And a student can join a meeting either from, excuse me, <laughs> either from a, uh, a mobile device or a computer by just clicking on join a meeting and entering that, per, that numeric ID and then clicking join. That requires a little more effort from them, but it's not onerous <laughs> to say the least. So that's another way you can get your students into your Zoom, personal Zoom meeting room. You can give them the meeting ID for that room, which does not change ever, it is always the same. So once you give it to them once, if they're smart enough to put it aside or jot it down on a sticky note and put it up on the wall, they'll always have it. They can always get into your Zoom meetings when you tell them that they're happening. So that's one way to go about it. You can just send them an email with the access information and the, the time and date of the meeting, and they can come in and join you, which is basically how you all got here. You got my, uh, uh, you got a message from Mary Kingsley that said, uh, Dave's gonna be doing a session from six to eight tonight. Here's the link for it. Click on the link and go in. And that makes accessing your Zoom meeting for your students about as simple as it can possibly be. It's so simple that if they're using a desktop or a laptop computer, they don't even have to load any software before starting. They can just click on that link and Zoom takes care of everything. And it will lead them by the hand and drop them right into your personal meeting room. On a mobile device, it's a little bit more complicated only because the student has to load the Zoom app on a smartphone or a tablet before they try to access your Zoom meeting. It's a free app. It's available from both the Android and the iOS app stores. It uh, can be identified by its icon, which if you look down at the very bottom of my screen here in my taskbar, you can see a little white camera in a blue square. That's the icon for the Zoom um, Zoom app, and that's the one they'll always use. So they need to do that right away, and then they'll be good for to go forever. On the Zoom with the on a portable device, the student can do can receive the email that you sent them and tap on the link in the email, and the device will automatically open up the Zoom app and drop them into your meeting. Or they can, if you've given them the meeting ID, they can tap join a meeting and let me show you that. Let me dump my phone out of the meeting. I've been kind of monitoring things to make sure I wasn't making any egregious errors. Um, but let me take it out and get it ready. Whoop, I don't want that, sorry. <laughs> Hit the wrong button. All right, and now I'm going to show you my cell phone. And this is gonna illustrate another capacity of Zoom. It's a little bit of an extended capacity and it requires some extra hardware, but it really increases the capability of Zoom. And this is called a USB document camera. And I have that open here. And in a second, it'll, there we go, it'll re, it'll update itself. This is a little camera on a stand off to my right side here that allows me to show you any, uh, anything that's sitting on my desktop here, physically, my physical desktop. Um, obviously, you can see my iPhone and you can see what's happening on the iPhone, but you can also use it like a whiteboard. You can put a legal pad or a piece of paper under it and write on the piece of paper with the high-tech uh, uh, communication device provided by Sharpie and or a pencil or whatever and you can lecture to your students and draw on what amounts to a, the whiteboard on your wall in the classroom at the same time and if you're teaching math or science or a lot of other disciplines I don't know how you'd do without that in lecturing in Zoom. And unfortunately, 
that requires some, an extra investment. That document camera is not probably not free unless you can find somebody to give you one. Um, and that is a critical part of le lecturing, especially in STEM fields. You really need that because it's difficult to put mathematical notations uh, into a like a canvas page or something like that, or into Word. Uh, it's much easier to write things like that and draw things like that on paper. And uh, the uh, document camera gives you that capability. Let me stop my share just for a second and show you what that thing looks like. Give you a vision of what I'm talking about. Uh, close your eyes for a second. I don't want to make anybody seasick here. <laughs> I don't want motion sickness. Uh, let's see. There you go. Where is he? There he is. Right there. That's him. That is called a... Um, well, darn it. I can't seem to keep the camera on him. There he is. An IPVO USB document camera. Not much to look at. The current ones don't look like that, but that's what I'm using right now. If I share my screen again, that's what I'm using to show you my iPhone. This works because the document camera comes with an application that throws what the document camera is seeing up on my computer screen. And with Zoom, of course, I can share anything that comes up on my computer screen with my students, with my attendees, with my colleagues in this case. So the document camera allows you to uh, have that extra dimension of communication with your students. And um, your students can enter your Zoom meetings using their phones or their tablets. The iPad works essentially the same way, for instance. This is an old iPhone. And here's the Zoom app right here. And that's loaded in the usual way from the App Store. Trust me, the students know how to do that. So we can enter the Zoom app just by tapping that app. If I had a link to this meeting somewhere I, in my email, which I probably do, but I don't want to spend time looking for it, I could just tap on that link. And as long as the Zoom, meet is, uh, Zoom app is on the uh, phone, it would automatically open up the Zoom app and drop me into the meeting. But the other way I can join the meeting is to tap where it says join here. And I can type in the meeting ID, which as I just indicated to you, I showed you where to find yours, but mine is 391 uh, 499. I should have this memorized by now. Maybe if it were earlier in the day, I could remember it. Uh, 5946. Yeah, 5946. That's pretty good. 5946. And I think I got that right. Then I just tap the big button that says join. And in we go. I have to real quick here, mute the audio on the phone. Before. 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 Uh -oh. Uh -oh. That's what happens otherwise. <laughs> we'll, let that, we'll give that time to die down. I've turned my speakers off here, so I, I can't hear you right now. You can still hear me, I hope. And I don't think you're getting uh, feedback. Let me know if you are in the chat tool. So, um, yeah, we got an infinite loop right now. I like standing, but it's like standing between two mirrors because I'm showing you the iPhone while I'm sharing my screen, showing you the iPhone, while I'm sharing your screen, showing you the iPhone, and so on, to infinity. It's kind of an interesting effect. That's not something you'll normally have to worry about. Uh, so uh, that's how you enter a Zoom meeting on the iPhone. I'm going to pull this out of the meeting right now.
to kill any possibility of that. Uh, there's the leave button up there to kill any possibility of that feedback loop continuing. I'll put it back in later. You can get one of these document cameras. I see someone put this in the, uh, oh, Lori, thank you so much. Uh, Lori Saldana has just put a link, and saved me the trouble, of putting a link to a, an updated version of this same document camera on Amazon. Uh, if you're interested in this, I would not wait too long. This thing's been going in and out of stock over the last couple of weeks. You never know when they're just gonna, their production's gotta be somewhat limited. So you wanna, if you, wanna, if you want this, you better get it now. Uh, thanks very much, Lori. And let's see, I can probably turn my speakers back on now. Yep, okay. So, the uh, that can be had. There, there is also a way to improvise this using a cell phone. We have a link to that thing, sort of thing on a site that you do want to know about. So I'll need to mention that at some point anyway. And that is our online on-demand video site at sdccdolvid.org. Let me bring up a bigger version of that. Let's see, I've got that here somewhere, I thought. Nope, okay, I just have to add that then. I'll put that in the chat tool. it in there we go it's SDCCD's online video tutorial site and that's in the chat tool the let me get that off the screen for a second and here it is uh, you can search for resources on this site. The search box here is critical to using the site. And if you just type Zoom, you'll get all of our tutorials that have something to do with Zoom. Press enter. And here's, uh, I just went over the process of starting a Zoom meeting and providing your students the information they need to join you. Well, there's all of that in. There's that in a, in a tutorial that's a lot shorter than the time it took me to do it <laughs> tonight, probably. Here's using your Zoom personal meeting room and setting up join before host. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But down below here, let's see, must be on the next page. This is usually on the front page somewhere. Huh, where do I put that? I'm not quite sure what went wrong there. I'll have to check that. But here's the video I'm talking about. It's featured on the front page. Um, board casting is a term that's occasionally applied to this technique that I'm showing you with the document camera of. Uh, simulating a whiteboard on your in your zoom meeting and this is a little improvised setup that will uh basically the point of this is to suspend your your smartphone above a sheet of paper on the desktop at, at the right height and and uh, uh, and location physically so that you can use the camera in your smartphone as a document camera. It's not nearly as easy to use or as, uh, as uh, effective as the USB document camera, but it will work. 
I see somebody trying it by holding their phone up <laughs> right now in the session. Uh, but um, yeah, there you are, ruler, ruler, smartphone, rubber band. You got it, Lee. <laughs> I just happen to be seeing your video right now. <laughs> cool. So you can do this even if you don't have the hundred dollar document camera, which I, you know, I hate to. You know, certainly nobody could tell you you have to spend a hundred dollars to do this, but it will make your life a lot easier i'll tell you that i couldn't i could not imagine lecturing especially in a stem field without this capability in zoom it's, it really is uh, critical so that's a couple of different ways you can get that and laurie thanks again for putting the uh, uh, uh that link to the thing on amazon uh the document camera on amazon in the chat tool you can keep all those links that I'm putting and Lori and other people are putting into the chat tool for your use later by saving the chat log. And you can always do that in a Zoom meeting. In the chat box, and I wish I could show you this, but Zoom won't send this window downstream when I'm sharing my screen. It's considered to be an internal host only thing and it won't show it to you. So I have to describe it in the chat tool, in the lower right-hand corner of the chat tool, all the way down to the right, there is a little menu button that shows as, a, as three uh, horizontal dots, an ellipsis. And if you click on that tool, you have an option to save the chat. It saves it to your documents folder on your computer or to the file area, I would assume, on your smartphone. Well, I haven't actually tried that, come to think of it. But it certainly will save it on your computer to the uh, documents folder in, in a folder called Zoom that's created automatically when you save something from Zoom. And within the Zoom folder, there may be several different meetings listed there. And the meetings are. Uh, identified by date and time. And you can tell which meeting was which. You open up the meeting folder and the chat log will be a text file stored inside that. For instance, on a PC, it looks something like this. You can go to your documents folder and you'll find a Zoom folder inside that. And these, this is a, I do a lot of Zoom recordings. So, <laughs> You find probably the one you want will be at the bottom of the list. And I, uh, this is the one, uh, let's see, yep, that's the one tonight. If I open up that folder, here's your chat tool, uh, your chat log. You can just open that up in your default text editor by double clicking it, and there's the chat log. So you can keep these links. Save the chat. I would save the chat just before you leave the meeting so that you uh, have everything that's in it. Though you can save it multiple times. So maybe you save it right now and then you save it at the end of the meeting too. So you don't miss any of this wonderful information that many of your colleagues are putting in the chat tool. It's kind of a little side, converse, side uh, channel to the Zoom meeting that can be used to provide useful information. So let's get back to where we were here. Now, um, we've started the Zoom meeting and we've talked about one way to provide your student, students access, but there are other ways. We can also, using Canvas, embed these Zoom, this Zoom access information into Canvas. So let's go to Canvas and take a look at how we can do that in Canvas. Just trying to remember, there's Canvas. Stop this, go to a course, just an empty course here somewhere, we'll do fine. Oh, that's that's one I was using this morning. It's more or less empty. Okay, 
how can you give students the information they need about accessing your Zoom meetings from within Canvas? Well, one thing you can do, uh, we've already talked about emailing the, the information to them through the inbox tool, but what if you want to put it in the Canvas so it's always there? That's a good idea. You might have a getting started module in your Zoom course, for instance, where you could put this information. You can put this into Canvas by adding an item to the module by clicking on the plus sign here and add an external URL, a web link. The URL you want to put here is your Zoom meeting room, your personal Zoom meeting room uh, URL or web link. Let me see where I have that here. There it is. Go back here. Here's my personal Zoom join URL in the meetings tab. It's also in your profile too under Zoom, so we can go there as well. Looks a little different. Mine looks a little different in the profile because I've customized mine. I wish I hadn't done that. So I'll just copy that to the clipboard. Then I'll go back to Canvas and I'll put that URL in this uh, web link here. I'll give this a, a, a name like Zoom link. Add the item, publish it for students. Now, if a student comes in and wants to access your personal meeting room, they click on that link and bada bing, they're going into Zoom. They just click open Zoom meetings or whatever they, uh, and uh, on a computer, on the smartphone, it's just gonna go right in. And then they're gonna join your Zoom session. And they're gonna end up in the right session with you. I'm going to cancel. I don't want to try to put myself in two Zoom meetings at once. One's enough at this time of night. So good. We're in there. Uh, boom, 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 boom. What else can I say about that? Uh, okay, there are other ways to put that link in to Canvas. Uh, you could put that link into the course menu here in Canvas. Uh, you can, and I think I'm not going to spend the time on that right now because there's something coming up I want to save some time for. But I'm going to show you a tutorial that you can use that will do that for you. Again, you go in. It happens to be in the um, in this tutorial right here, which is on the front page right now, but to be safe, you should search for Zoom. And for sure that tutorial will pop up. And here we go, starting a Zoom meeting and providing your students the information they need to join you. Is the one or this one, using your personal meeting room in Zoom, allowing your attendees to join before you, that will work fine too. Either one of those tutorials will have the information in it that will show you how to create a link in your Canvas menu to your Zoom personal meeting room. So you can find that information in here. Or if you want to put that as a question into the chat tool, I'll cover it later after the end of the meeting. I just don't want to run out of time to give you all the basics here tonight and cause everybody to have to stay late. Though again, all those questions you've put in the chat tool, I will answer. If I haven't already answered them in the presentation, I'll answer them tonight. And for that matter, I'll answer them again, just to be sure that everybody understands. So don't worry about being closed out of that. All right, let's see our outline here. Um, now, I want to show you how to use the host tools in the, in the Zoom menu 
that show up during a meeting when you are the host. What you're seeing in your uh, Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen as a participant in this meeting is a subset of what I'm seeing um, as the host. And I want you to see what those look like before you actually try to run a Zoom meeting and see how you can use them. Unfortunately, I can't do that live because Zoom won't show that kind of information during a screen share like I'm doing right now. So what I have to, had to do was record myself in a different program using the Zoom menus and record it in my explanation as I went along. And I have to play that video back for you in order for you to see it. So like the old coach, I'm going to show movies in class tonight. And you can do this too. I'm going to uh, find my video, which is in, I have my videos in YouTube for the most part. So let me find where I have my YouTube uh, up, not there, not, yeah, there we go. And I'm going to go to my YouTube studio, my list of videos I have on YouTube. I could have, I could also search for this in the online on demand video site since I've also linked them into there, but it's a little quicker this way. I don't want to keep you any longer than we have to tonight. So I need to find that video here. There it is, using the Zoom control menu. That's the one I want. So I'll click on that. I'll go to it in YouTube. And in a second, I'm going to play it. But before right I do that, away, I'm not going to go into great detail. Blah, blah, blah. Ah, not ready yet. Don't get ahead of me there, YouTube. Very well. I'm about to play movies in class. First thing I'm going to do is stop my screen share for a second, and then I'm going to re and reshare my screen, and I'm going to be sure that I had checked the option in the box that comes up when I share my screen, and you'll see this in a minute in the movie. But there's an option when you share your screen to share your computer sound as well, and I have to do that in order for you to hear this video. So I want to check, yes, I've selected that option. And I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going to full screen this video to make it as big as I possibly can for you. And I'm going to play it. This is about, how long is it? Uh, about 22 minutes long, sorry. But that's about the time it takes to show you these Zoom tools. So let me get that started. I'll be watching the chat box while you're listening to this. Hi there, and welcome to a quick trip through the Zoom tools and menus that you'll see when you're uh, in a Zoom meeting as the host. Some of these menus and tools are also available to participants, but we're specifically going to look at the host view here today. We have to pre-record this because you can't do this while you're in Zoom. I can't share this with you while you're in Zoom. And uh, the f we'll start with the general view. Uh, you'll probably come up by default in speaker view, which shows whoever is talking in full screen. Actually, I've messed with this a little bit because I have pinned myself so you can see me in this. If I unpin the video, what you will see is actually your attendee who last spoke or who is currently speaking. And I'm going to go ahead and pin myself back there. That's something you can do for recording purposes. Um, the other option for uh, viewing the meeting is gallery view. The button will be in the upper right hand corner here and it's a toggle back and forth. If I click that, I go to gallery view, which is something like the old Hollywood Squares view where you see everyone who has a webcam right. I have three devices in the, in the meeting right now. This is my hosting computer. This is my smartphone. And this is another, this is a laptop in another room. 
so uh, you get a much better feel for who else is in the system and you can watch them and uh, take visual cues from them and so on. But either one will work. Uh, the zoom menu will normally be at the bottom of the screen. It might show up on one side or the other uh, if uh, settings have been changed, but 99% of the time it'll be at the bottom. If you don't see a menu at the bottom of the screen, mouse over the video window and it should pop up. We'll start from left to right here. The first icon in the lower left is the microphone or the sound icon. This, uh, the thing you'll do most often here is mute yourself. You can do that by just clicking on it and then clicking again. When you're muted, there'll be a red slash through it. You can mute or not as you wish in a meeting. It's probably a good idea to stay muted at, at least most of the time when you're, if you're not presenting in the meeting. Though, if there's not a lot of sound in your vicinity, it's not really that critical. Um, next to the, uh, oh, and the sound icon will also show you that you're transmitting. The microphone icon will. If you see the little green uh, bar rising up in the microphone, you know you're transmitting. There's also a menu associated with this icon right next to it. There's a little up carrot. We click that. Uh, we can select, if we have more than one microphone, we can select the microphone we want to use. And if you have more than one uh, output device, more than one set of speakers attached to your computer, you can select the ones you wish. You can also test your speakers and microphone, which is a very good thing to do before the meeting starts. <laughs> Yes, I hear a ringtone. Yes, I hear a ringtone. Ring yep, yeah, I did hear that reply, and you're finished. So it'll tell you if your uh, sound uh, devices are working. You can switch to phone audio. Your, there are two options for audio and Zoom. One is computer audio, voice over IP, through Zoom itself. The other is to use your phone, either your smartphone or a desk phone, to both speak and hear the audio. Uh, the vast majority of the time you'll want to use the computer audio unless you don't have speakers attached to your computer. Uh, you can also change audio settings at any time. The next icon, a little stylized camera, is your video control icon. This allows you to control whether other people can see you if you have a webcam. You can turn off your video by clicking on the webcam and you'll go to the, the little uh, red slash will appear and you'll no longer appear to your attendees. And just clicking it again will bring you back. Speaking as someone who does a lot of Zoom meetings, it's always nice when you leave your video on because as a presenter, I can see what uh, you're thinking sometimes, <laughs> and see if I'm losing you, things like that. It's much better uh, if you leave it on in general, general terms. There's also a video settings menu next to the little camera. You can, if you have more than one camera attached to your computer, you can select which one you want to use. Indeed, I've used up to four cameras attached to a single computer in a Zoom meeting for, before, where each one was looking at something different. And you have that option. You can only use one camera at a time, but you can quickly switch between them using this menu here. You also have a video settings menu, which you can use in a variety of ways. I'm not going to go into great detail there, but you can uh, set your uh, screen aspect ratio, you can set uh, your uh, whether to use high definition if your webcam is capable of it. Uh, you can mirror so that things are not turned left to right and so on. You and uh, most of the rest of these you just leave on as is. Uh, you can also in the video menu go to the virtual background. Uh, which I have behind me right now. What I have behind me is actually a, a wall, a green wall, actually. But I can put any of these virtual backgrounds behind myself 
and you can upload your own pictures, which is what I have here is a picture out my back window. Um, this you can do this. It works a little better with a green screen, but you don't have to have a green screen if you have a reasonably consistent background behind you with a, not a lot of uh, not real clutter. It may work anyway. It's always worth a try if you want to try that. So that's how you set a virtual background, or you can go directly to that in this that setting in this uh, menu here as well by just hitting choose a virtual background, pick the photo that you want to use, and uh, see what happens. Here's your invite button. This allows you, if you have a running meeting, to invite people to it. Uh, you can uh, you can go directly to your Yahoo Mail if you have that up, and it will give you a message that you can send to whomever you wish that has all the information necessary to access the meeting. So that's a useful thing sometimes. Uh, let's see. That's probably the easiest way. Another thing you can do is copy your Zoom URL to your clipboard and just paste that into an email and send it right away. But you've usually taken care of this before you start the meeting. You, as the host, can manage your participants in certain ways. First off, you can see who's in there, who's in there with you very quickly, how many people there are, and get some information about who they are, depending on how they've logged in. Uh, you can mute or unmute them at will, he said. What that does is send a message to them asking them to unmute themselves, actually. Uh, you can also chat with them directly. You can stop their video. You can make them the, a host so that they can do things that normally only you can do. Or a co well, you can make them the host and cut yourself off or make them a co-host and they can do some of the things you can do that normally they wouldn't be able to. You can allow them to record, which people will occasionally request, record by themselves. So they get their own recording of this. Um, if they happen to be a, um, a real-time captioner in your meeting in order to provide that uh, service, you can assign that to them. You can rename them, or you can kick them out of the meeting in an extreme circumstance. We won't be doing that today. <laughs> uh, also, here are buttons where you can do things like, uh, oh, you can, or rather, you can mute everyone at one time if you need to. You can unmute everyone, and you can set certain default behaviors. This is where you can also answer questions or surveys, yes, no. They can ask for go slower, go faster. They can like, dislike, and so on. It just, But mainly what you're doing here as the host is looking to see who's in the meeting with you and uh, muting and unmuting them at need more often than not. All righty, I'm not going to do polls right now. Uh, that's something we'll take up later in another video. We can uh, share our screens. This is one of the most important capabilities of Zoom, so you definitely need to know how to do that. This button right here is very pl prominently featured to share your computer screen so that people can see what you're doing on your computer in a in a lecture situation, you just click that button and it asks you, well, what do you want to share? Almost always you will want to share your desktop, your entire screen. That's much simpler. Just do that uh, and you'll be fine. Uh, you also have the option to share a whiteboard. 
but that's not going to come up in it very often, and there are better options for that that I'll show you later in the presentation. But you probably want to share your dashboard. Here I have three dashboards because I have three screens on this machine. You will not probably have that, though you may well have two. Uh, but I would share your entire screen. There are a couple of uh, options down here at the bottom that you may want to consider if you're going to be sharing video with your attendees, like playing a YouTube video that you'd like them to see and hear. In that event, you should check both of these options. Those the default is to have those off. And then just click Share. Now, um, whoever is attending this meeting is seeing this, whatever's on my desktop. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? I can move, this is my control bar that I have when I'm sharing, and I can move that to the top and bottom of the screen to get it out of the way if I need to. So let's say here I, I might well be sharing my Canvas dashboard. Everybody in the meeting is now seeing my Canvas dashboard. And whatever I do here in real time shows up on their screens. And the sharing performance in Zoom is amazing. Even at relatively low bandwidth, your people who are in the meeting with you will be able to see your screen and what you're doing on it re in pretty much in real time. And you can play videos, like play a YouTube video. They will be able to see it and hear it there may be some minor issues with lip sync if someone is talking in a close-up, but other than that, it's going to be nearly perfect. Uh, in this little control bar here, you can do a number of things. You can stop your video because there will be somewhere a little thumbnail with your video in it. You still have access to manage participants, just as you did when you were showing your webcam. Polls. You can do a new share and replace this one. You can pause the share. If you want to do something for a moment that you don't want your attendees to see, you can pause the share. You can annotate. Uh, let's see. Draw circles around things draw arrows, um, you can erase stuff, you can spotlight things, use this little pointer that people have a hard time missing, you can um, draw, which is the default, get the spotlight off here, And you can type text on the screen for them to see if you want to label something. So there's quite a lot you can do with annotation here. We'll go ahead and clear that. Um, remote control. You can give someone control of your screen while you are uh, sharing your screen. They can request it from their menus, which they have while you are sharing, and then you can give it to them and they can show you something on your machine. Uh, and here are most of the other options that are not available in this menu bar, um, including your recording options and so on that you can change, and we'll look at in a moment. And if things get out of hand on annotations, you can disable participant annotations every time you need, anytime you need to. Need to. You can hide those floating meeting controls, um, or you can even end the meeting from here, which we definitely won't do right now. Hey, and when you're done with your share, just go ahead and click this red button right here that'll always be right below your share control panel and you'll be back with your participants seeing your webcam rather than your screen share. That's probably the most important thing that you need to know how to do in Zoom. Dave, when you were in uh, that, it had... Uh, sharing, uh, 
Let me pause for a second, yes. It, when you were showing us that list, it had, I saw the word closed caption. So does it automatically close caption or is that something tricky when you're no, showing that whole long list? Let's, let's take that up at the end of this video, okay? And yes, yeah, I'll answer that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, control menu. If you have this checked, other people other than you can share, but only one at a time. And then uh, we're not going to look at advanced sharing options right now. Probably the second most useful tool in Zoom is the chat tool. If I click on that, I get a little chat window. Whatever I type in this message box at the bottom will be displayed once I press enter on the keyboard. You can display it to everyone or to other individuals in the, uh, in the meeting. And I just press enter. Yes. It, whatever I type, appears here. You can put links in here, all, all sorts of useful stuff. Uh, when you're done with the meeting, near time when you're done, you can save the chat using this little chat menu here, if you like. And you can control who people can chat with and how and so on. So uh, the chat tool is very simple, very basic, works very reliably, and it's a wonderful thing to keep running as you're doing a presentation so that people can ask questions or participate or share comments without having to interrupt you. And you can move this window around on the screen. If you have multiple monitors, you can drag it right off to another screen and keep it open so that you can keep an eye on it the whole time. If you do not have the chat window open and somebody sends you a chat message, a little window will pop up at the bottom of the screen here with the first bit of the chat message in it alerting you to the fact that there is something in the chat you might want to look at. Recording. You can record your Zoom sessions in really very reasonable quality. Both your webcam video and Everybody else, anybody else who speaks, their video will, if they pop up on the screen, they'll be recorded. Their video will be recorded. And their audio will be, all audio is recorded, both yours and participant audio. The, um, whenever you share your screen, the screen shares will be recorded as well in quite reasonable qualities. This makes Zoom a screencasting tool as well as being a meeting tool. Usually, you'll have the option to either record to your local computer or to the cloud. Uh, if you have Confer Zoom uh, accounts, you have some cloud space that you can use for recordings as well. There are advantages to doing it both ways. And I have another video that we'll look at here in a minute that will show you how to do the recording. I'm not going to do that right now. But that's where you record. So if I wanted to record this session to the computer, I just click here. Recording. Everyone is told that you're recording them, so that there's no anybody has, nobody is surprised later. And the recording can, continues. You can pause or stop this recording at any time. And if you stop the recording, you can start another recording later, and Zoom will save both of the recordings when you exit from the meeting. Indeed, if you have recorded uh, at any time during the meeting, when you end the meeting, uh, the recording will automatically either be saved to the cloud or saved to a Zoom folder in your documents, fo uh, documents directory on your local computer. I'm just going to go ahead and stop that. Oh. The recording has stopped. And that pretty much covers what I wanted to on the Zoom menu here. You do have the option for closed caption. Uh, to save time, I'm going to stop it right there. That's pretty much everything I really needed to say. Uh, I tried to answer some questions in the chat tool as we were watching that. This is something you can, uh, this very video is something you can play over again if you need to revisit any of that. Um, 
You can find that on our online on-demand video site at sdccdolvid.org by searching for Zoom tutorials and just scrolling down. Let's see. Uh, there we are using the Zoom control menus as a host. That same video is right there. You can play that again or scroll through it and revisit a particular part of it. Uh, we did have a question there uh, during the thing about closed captioning and uh, somebody had seen the closed caption button in the host menus at the bottom of the screen. Yes, you can um, have live captions in a Zoom session. You have to request this from CCC Confer at least five days in advance. They will arrange for a live captioner, a very talented individual, to enter your room and to transcribe the uh, what you're saying in real time. And uh, there will be a window that students who need that can open up and see the transcription in real time. Um, I have not done that tonight because we do so many of these meetings that uh, we would seriously strain their resources in that regard. And I wanna leave that for uh, actual classroom instruction, but uh, it is something you can do. But remember, we are recording this meeting. And as an accommodation, when the um, meeting recording is loaded up onto either the Zoom cloud or into YouTube, the recording will be automatically captioned and it will be automatically captioned pretty well which is a good thing because there's no way you could edit an hour or two hour long recording every time you made one but uh, the captions will almost certainly be adequate but getting the real-time captioner in this is quite the uh, uh, requires a lot of prior planning and the cooperation of CCC confer you can request that from their website. If you want more information on that, I'll be happy to provide it. But right now, uh, we've seen basically how to run a Zoom meeting, how to use the controls in the Zoom menu while you're running a meeting and the various things you can do that will be very helpful to you to maintain uh, your students' experience in the meeting. But just as critical is the uh, means that you can uh, use to record your Zoom meeting and share that with your students later because some students will not be able to be there at the, at the regular time or may just choose not to be. <laughs> and you definitely want to have these recordings available to your students later on. So now we're going to spend some time talking about how to do that. In the video that just passed, I showed you how to um, uh, how to start the recording. You basically have two options for recording in Zoom. You can record to the Zoom cloud, or you can record to your local computer. If you choose to record to the Zoom cloud, your recording will be up in the sky at Zoom, and you can retrieve that and any well, you can retrieve access information for that at any time. I have a little bit of worry about the Zoom cloud though because of the tremendous usage that Zoom is getting right now. So I like to record my sessions to my local computer, which is what I'm doing right now, and then put that up on YouTube. I know that whatever happens, up to the ultimate dissolution of civilization that Google and YouTube will still be there. I don't know about the Zoom cloud. If, if Google and YouTube go down, we have so many other problems that we're not gonna be worrying about our Zoom recordings. <laughs> the, the seas will be encroaching on the land and the, the graves will be opening up and the rapture will be in progress before Zoom and YouTube go away. So, um, I'm, con I'm confident that they will continue to work. So that's what I'm gonna show you how to do. First thing I need to show you is to make sure that you have the option 
in your Zoom account to record to your local computer. On the confer Zoom accounts, it's not the uh, it's not set open by default. So I can show you how to set that up by going into your Zoom settings in um, the in your Zoom uh, account pages at zoom.us. Go to the recordings. I'm sorry, to the settings tab. Excuse me. And then click where it says recording at the top of the screen. To make sure that you have the option to do local recording, just turn local recording on. Right here. All right, so you have that now the option to record to your local computer. If you're using a free account, recording to your local computer is your only option. You don't have access to the Zoom cloud on a free account. But in Confer Zoom, you have account access to both options. And you saw how to start a recording in the previous video. There's a little record button in your menu at the bottom of the screen. And this is something that really works best on a computer. So if you're, you're you really, if you possibly can, want to originate your Zoom recordings on a, or your Zoom sessions on a computer, a desktop computer or a laptop as opposed to an iPad or a phone or something like that. Your recording options are very limited there. The, um, so let's say I've started my Zoom recording, as I have right now, and I'm recording to my local computer. You just click on that record button in the Zoom menu and select record the local computer, and boom, it's going. And it'll tell you that it's recording, and it will keep recording throughout the entire meeting unless you stop or pause the recording, which you can do. But normally you'll just leave it on. And at the end of the meeting, when you end the meeting for everyone, just turn it off, Zoom will automatically render that video, prepare it for, uh, for video streaming, and then save it onto your hard drive in a folder called Zoom. That folder is the same folder I showed you before where your meeting, where the uh, meeting chat log was stored. But let's look at that again. Let me. Uh, do, 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 get this out of the way. Uh, and pull up my file manager, my Windows Explorer or Finder on the Mac. You'll find this folder in your uh, documents folder under Zoom. And each recording that you make will have its own little subfolder here. You'll be able to identify the recordings by uh, date and time. For instance, uh, this one right here is no, I can't. I can't magnify that, can I? This one right here says is named 2020-03-24-0904, which means it was done today, March 24th, 2020, and it started at 9.04 a.m. I must have forgotten to start that recording right at the beginning, <laughs> and somebody saved me. Uh, but that's when the recording was started. So to find the video file for the recording, you just open that menu, that uh, folder by double clicking it. And here is your meeting recording. It's in a file called zoom underscore zero. Now we just have to get that recording online. <clears throat> to do that, we have to upload it to YouTube. So I need to bring up YouTube. My YouTube interface. Here it is. Let's go to YouTube itself here. Just a second, let me get out of this YouTube studio thing and go to where, what you'd hit when you first logged in, when you first brought YouTube up. Ignore all this stuff. Come on. Well, let me just start it over again. YouTube dot com. I was in too deep. 
All right, this is what YouTube looks like when it comes up from scratch. Just go to youtube.com. You will need a YouTube account if you want to store your videos on YouTube. That is free. And in fact, it's actually just a, a Google account. If you use any of Google's tools like Gmail or Google Docs, Google Drive, you already have a YouTube account. It's your Google account. If you have that, you'll see a little circle in the upper right hand corner of the screen here. And let me move that over a little bit so people on smartphones can see that. It's right here in the upper right corner of the YouTube window. And there'll either be a picture of you if you've uploaded a picture to your Google account or just a silhouette. But if you see either one of those, you are logged into your Google account and your YouTube account is ready for you. If you don't see that, you'll see a little sign in button up there and you can sign into your Google account. If you don't have a Google account, which is unlikely these days, but if you don't have a Google account, you can go to accounts.google.com and you can sign up for one. I've, I've got one, so it knows who I am. But the, if you don't have an account, you'll get an invitation here to sign up for one. So let's go back to YouTube. So let's assume you've got your Google account, you've signed into Google or into, yeah, into Google, and you're in YouTube. At this point, putting a video up on YouTube is almost trivially simple. You just go to this little button here in the upper right, hand, also in the upper right hand corner of the screen, and that looks like a little camera with a plus sign inside it. And you click on that little camera, and you're given the option to upload a video. If at this point you have not created what's called a YouTube channel, that is if you've never used YouTube before, you will be prompted to do so. There's just a couple of mouse clicks and then you can continue. It's not a big deal. I can't show you that because I've had a YouTube channel for 15 years and I'm not about to delete it to, <laughs> to show that. So once you start the upload process, uh, YouTube asks you to select the file you want to upload. You click on that blue box and go to your documents folder and your Zoom folder under that. And you find the Zoom or you find the video that you want to upload, your Zoom video. And this one from this morning, I've not uploaded yet. So let me, let me do that and I'll kill two birds with one stone here. Uh, this was the one I did this morning on Canvas. So I can make that available to you on YouTube by opening that folder and selecting the zoom underscore zero file and just clicking open in the dialog box here and bing, the upload process starts and we'll continue. You just have to do a little bit. You have to give it a title better than zoom underscore zero, which was the file name. This was an, this is a canvas overview. And I have several recordings of canvas overview sessions on there already. So I better date that 3-24-2020. And that's probably enough. Um, you will also, if you haven't done it before, tell Google that the videos you make are not for kids. And by kids, they mean someone under 13. And no, <laughs> unless you have a prodigy in one of your high school classes, the co-enrollment classes, there's no 13 year olds in there. Lie anyway, if there is one, <laughs> tell them no, because then you gotta go through all kind of hoops. And then you just click next. On this next screen, there's nothing you have to do. Just click next again. And the only thing you have to do on the last screen is tell YouTube what kind of visibility you want for your YouTube video. Uh, you don't want to ever use private for these instructional videos. It's too restrictive. You'd use that for like if you're putting baby movies up on YouTube and you really didn't want anybody else to ever see. So you're, you're, you got to choose between public and unlisted. Public means anybody can see the video, anybody can play the video and they can search for it and it can come up in, uh, in searches. 
uh, of YouTube and of the web in general. So it's real public. Anybody might watch it. Unlisted means in order for someone to watch this, you have to give them the URL. But as long as they have the URL, they can watch it without logging in or anything. Uh, if the video contains information that you don't want to share with the world outside of your class, you would select unlisted. If it's a video that you don't care if other people see and that might be of interest to someone else outside of your class, you can make it public. But the majority of these recordings are usually done unlisted because after all your students will be showing and their names will be showing and we could get into FERPA violation territory. So generally your um, Zoom um, recordings will be, un will, you'll want them to be unlisted. So you select that and you click save. That's the only thing you have to worry about there. And you'll get a screen that shows you the progress of your video uploading. Well, that one's a big video, so it's gonna take a while. So I'm just gonna close this screen. And eventually that video will appear at the top of your channel videos list that pops up automatically when you finish the upload. Uh, interaction with YouTube. Um, I'm not going to wait for that one to, to upload and process and so on because that's going to take a while. But I am going to, let's take a, let's look at a, one that I uploaded earlier um, on, uh, I guess I did this one this morning. I will um, click on that. I can get the information I need about that video to share it with my students by clicking this little pencil icon here. And here's what I need over here, the link to this video. I can copy that link to my clipboard and then I'm done with YouTube for the moment anyway. You can just get that out of the way. And now the question becomes, how do you make this recording visible to your students? Well, the most common way to do that, well, you could just email them that link. That would be the, the minimum tech way to do it. Or more likely, you'll put a link to that video in Canvas. You can put a link to that video in Canvas right into a module by adding an external um, URL to a module in Canvas, pasting that share URL that we got from YouTube into the URL box and uh, putting an appropriate label on it, like um, Canvas Overview Recording, and you might add the date to it or whatever, but I'm not going to worry about that. And you, when you do video links in web links in a uh, Canvas module like this, you always want to load the video in a new tab. It works much better. And then add the item. And that's all it takes to share that video with your students. If they come in and click on that link, it starts to play in YouTube. Bada bang, nothing to it. Um, you can also embed these videos in Canvas pages. You can go back to your module here. You could create a page in Canvas. New page. Oop, except that I didn't give the page a name. Um, let's see, we'll call this video page for Zoom recording or something similar. Edit that page. And this is, of course, is a little Canvas tutorial here. And I can go, I can put that video into a Canvas page by using the insert edit media tool in the Canvas rich content editor and pasting that YouTube URL into the source box here and clicking OK. 
And there you get a nice sexy little embed and the student can just click on that and play it right inside there. They can full screen it. Making your videos available Everything. to your students in Canvas. Pause it there. By the way, there's a way to prevent YouTube from popping up those suggested videos at the end of your video. And I've put a tutorial on how to do that in our online video site. And I can send you that link if you want to email me about it. But you can, that's the one thing that's a little irritating about YouTube in an instructional setting. And you can prevent it from happening. But it's not the end of the world if it does happen. The students will still be able to view your video. So if we save that, now we've got a Canvas page in our Canvas module that has that uh, video embedded in it. So that's how you can share your video recordings, your Zoom video recordings with your students. You might create a module in Canvas called Zoom recordings and put all of them in there so the students can go right through them um, very quickly up to you or you could put each one in the content module in canvas that's related that uh, has information about that particular part of your course that uh, had to do that it was the subject of that zoom meeting either way so um that's how to get your to record your zoom meetings and get them into canvas you can also link zoom meetings from the um Canvas cloud or the Zoom cloud in the Canvas, and uh, I've got uh, a tutorial online at that site that will show you how to do that as well. But I, I can't show every possible option here tonight. So let's see what I have forgotten here. I've got one minute left, Chief, and I know it's eight o'clock. I'm sorry. We'll get done with this just as quick as I can here. And remember, I'm recording this, so if you want to come back in the last few minutes, you can always do that later. And it will be online on that on-demand video site. Oh, let's see, that's not it. Where is my, there it is. That's the one I want. And here's my outline. Let's see, we've done recording, we've shown broadcasting, shown you how to use Zoom mobile and how to integrate it and how to get your Zoom meetings into Canvas, your recordings into Canvas. And earlier, I showed you how to put links to your Zoom meetings into Canvas. So I have covered everything that I set out to cover tonight, not necessarily in this exact order, but I believe we've gotten through it. So now it's time for me to answer the questions that are in the chat tool. And I tried to take care of some of those earlier. So let's go back and make sure that I've gotten everything. And you can add more questions, but I do want to take the ones in the chat tool. And you can just ask questions by unmuting yourself a little later. First, I want to get the ones that are in the chat tool. And uh, Margaret, thank you very much for the reminder to record. Margaret's been in my meetings before and knows that's my. Um, okay, let's see. How do I migrate Microsoft Outlook to Zoom? Uh, Microsoft Outlook and Zoom really have nothing to do with one another that I can think of. So I need a little more information on that one. You can always email me with these questions with more information and I will, I will get back to you. Um, I've been keeping up with my email pretty well over the last couple of days. Sometimes it gets ahead of me because I'm online so much, but I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do I see some students' picks and not others? I presume you mean in the gallery view on Zoom. Well, some people have webcams and others don't. That's part of the reason. Also, people can turn their video off even if they do have a webcam using the little camera icon. I think I mentioned down in the Zoom menus. So not when you go in the gallery view in Zoom, not everyone will be visible. Uh, Lori, your IPVO camera came today. Woo! Terrific. Congratulations. 
Let me know if you have any questions about using it. How do you upload a picture in Zoom so that when you're not sharing your video, a picture of you shows up? Good question. You can do that on the Zoom website. Again, you have to log in as yourself at zoom.us and you can go to your profile. Oh. And um, here's your profile picture. You can add a new one. If you haven't got one, there'll be an option to add one or you can change the one you have by just uploading it from your local computer. I think there may even be an option to take a screenshot. No, 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 you gotta, you gotta upload it. So you just click upload here and you find a picture on your computer that you've already loaded up to your computer. That's you. Somebody, I'll use somebody cuter than me here. <laughs> Uh, upload. I thought I said that. Open. Oh, that is that bigger than two megabytes? Hmm. Wouldn't have thought that. Oh well. Yes. You can pick a file, upload it, and then save it, and you will have your picture up on there. All righty. My audio died, how do I turn it back on? Probably you, uh, I muted you probably. So you can turn yourself back on by clicking the microphone icon in the Zoom menu at the bottom of the screen, which you bring up by either mousing over the screen or tapping the screen if you're on a mobile device. I showed you how to mute everyone in that video. You use the participant, if you're the host, when you click on the participants link in the, um, uh, zoom menu, you'll have an option to mute all. I wish I could show you that, but it's just not going to show that to you. But uh, it was in that video and there is a mute all button. And when you mute everyone, you have the option to also to prevent them from unmuting themselves. But you, I like, I only do that in an extreme situation where I've just kind of lost control of the meeting. You all have been so well behaved tonight. <laughs> I appreciate that so much. So I've been able to leave you the option to um, uh, unmute yourself the whole time. Thanks for that. All right. Uh, I don't have a camera. Do you need a camera? I have a, just a mic and headphones. Uh, if you're originating the meeting, uh, if you're the host of the meeting and you're talking to your students, it really makes a difference if you have a camera. You can do it with just a microphone and, and, your, and your speakers, just a microphone and speakers, but your students miss a lot. I strongly recommend the webcam. You can, I know it's very difficult to get webcams right now. They're sold out everywhere. But I do have, I did find an app for a smartphone, either an Android or an iPhone, that will allow you to use the camera in your smartphone as a webcam. And if you will email me a request for that, I'll send it to you. I don't wanna uh, spend a lot of time on that tonight. I will put the name of the app in the chat tool. It's called Epoch Cam, E-P-O-C-C-A-M. And the, let's see if I have that website up here somewhere. I'll put the URL for it in too. So let me just go, let me just look for it again here. E-P-O-C-C-A-M. And of course the, the formal presentation ended some moments ago. <laughs> Wasn't formal to start with, but the, the presentation per se ended. Now I'm working on questions. You can stay as long as you want. I will not leave while there's still questions in the chat tool or that people have uh, that they want to just speak up. Yeah, there's Canoni is the name of the company that makes it. That's the link to it. 
and I've put that in the chat tool and sent it to everyone. But that can turn your web, your smartphone into a webcam. And it work, it's a little twitchy getting it started, but it works like it. Once you get it going, it works like a shot. The main requirement is the, your uh, smartphone and your computer have to be on the same Wi-Fi network. You have to have a Wi-Fi network, and both machines, both the smartphone and the computer, have to be on the Wi-Fi network. Otherwise, you can't uh, do that. But chances are that's already the case for you at home. All right. Go back up. I need to know how to log in through ConferZoom. According to my Canvas account, I have an account with my college email address, but I don't get how to log in. I don't know my own password. Okay, um, you can get that. You can go to Zoom and let me log out. You can, you can go to the Zoom website, zoom.us, because ConferZoom accounts are Zoom accounts too, so you can access them from here. You can sign in. Your email address will almost for your confer Zoom account will almost certainly be your uh, district email address. Mine is different because of some history I have with the whole process, but yours will be your district email address. And the password, take your best guess. And if it doesn't work, click the forgot password uh, link below the sign in button. And then just provide uh, Zoom with your district email address and tell it to convince them you're not a robot by clicking that box there and then send. And they will send you an email to your district account with instructions on how to reset your password to that account. And then you'll be able to log in to your confer Zoom account on the Zoom website. Uh, uh, how soon will we be able to watch tonight's recorded session? Depends on whether my wife lets me sit down here after I'm done tonight or not. I'll try to get it online tonight, if not first thing in the morning. Uh, there's a syllabus I want to remove and upload another. Can you tell me how? That's a Canvas question. I'll be happy to answer that, but I am going to copy that and put it somewhere so, where, so I won't forget it. And I'll take care of that at the end because we're, I want to take Zoom questions first tonight. So let me put that somewhere where I won't lose it. So I don't forget that, okay. Today I, oh, this is one I can really relate to. Today I ended up in a different Zoom meeting than my students and got an email that said your attendees are waiting. When I used that and closed the meeting, I was, uh, eventually everything worked out. How can I make sure that doesn't happen again? That is the only way I've ever seen Zoom fail. And the answer to that question to avoid that possibility is to always use your personal meeting room. And you can do that by starting your Zoom meetings from the Zoom website. Let me sign back in here. I think I signed out of that. Okay, go to your meetings tab at the Zoom website, go to your personal meeting room and click, this will say start meeting when you're not already in a meeting. And then just click there and I get, and it, then if you have sent your students your personal meeting room URL or the meeting ID, they will be in the same room with you and that will prevent that from happening. That'll never happen. That's why I like to do it this way because that, happens all in you ending up in one room and the students ending up in another happens all too often otherwise this is something that will work every time okay thanks very much for that uh, question that allowed me to harp on that again um having to start my meeting in a chromebook and iPad. Chromebooks should work fine because all of this is done through a web browser. So the Chromebook should work fine. I would use the Chromebook 
rather than the iPad to originate your meetings in Zoom because Chromebook actually has a camera and a microphone built into it probably and um, will work better than your iPad. Your iPads and cell phones are a great way to attend a meeting, but not such a good way to host a meeting. I'm having, I um, don't know over there. How I, how do I make sure I am the one starting the meeting and I am the host? Well, if you start the meeting in your personal meeting room, you are the host, period. Oh, someone uh, was uh, using log me in to log into their desktop computer from home. That's really cool. And then attending a Zoom meeting that way. That, that's really kind of out there. And I'm glad it worked. Uh, yeah, you might have some trouble with your uh, microphone sharing across machines like that. But that's, that's a pretty cool thing. That's, that's not a generally useful answer so i'm not going to spend a lot of time on it but i am impressed is there any way we can see how many students are attending i thought there were four but there are actually 37 i know that feeling uh yeah in your participants box in the um in your zoom menus at the top of the participant box it tells you how many people are in the meeting right now we have 34 left in the meeting we were up to 70 or 80 at one point but that's at the top of the participants box that's a lot easier than counting the squares on your screen in gallery view <laughs> all righty now here we've got I'm running on down i'm just going past a bunch of email addresses thank you for doing that so this is not quite as long as it might be, <laughs> thank goodness. Uh, somebody asked how, to, how again can I save the chat? Uh, in the chat box, in the lower right-hand corner of the chat box is a little menu icon with three dots in a row. You click on that and you'll get an option to save the chat. And you can do that as often as you like, but do it just before you leave the meeting for sure so that you uh, do not, don't miss anything that went into the chat tool just before you left uh, uh, well this is, starts out as a compliment and ends as a question thank you for the compliment you have mastered eye contact every other person seems to be looking stage right how do you do that I believe in eye contact and you're right, that makes a big difference in something like this. What you have to remember is that your audience is in the, in the lens of your webcam. So I have my webcam set on the top of my monitor that I'm using for screen share and for uh, to hold my Zoom uh, menu or uh, my Zoom application. So when I'm looking at that monitor, it appears that I'm looking into the webcam, even if I'm look, not looking directly into it like I am right now. <laughs> so that's, that's the secret to that. Uh, put your webcam right at the top of your primary monitor or your only monitor. And, um, and also you just wanna remember that that's where your audience is. Occasionally I do have to look left or right. I have two other screens on this machine. Help me, and sometimes I'm, I'm looking away from it but I try to keep eye contact as often as I can because you're right, that matters in a Zoom meeting. Your students really feel like you're looking at them and not through them. Not a webcam in stock in any store in town, two to three weeks delivery online, I know. That's where that Epoch Cam app might help. If you wanna try that, the app itself, I think the pro, there's a free version you can download and try to see if it'll work on, if, ever, if you can get it to work. And if you can, the pro version, which you'd probably want for um, an actual uh, Zoom meeting is I think eight bucks. So it's cheaper than a webcam by a long shot. 
and it, it's worth a try. But again, that to use that uh, workaround, you have to have both your computer and your smartphone on the same Wi-Fi network. And I am so sorry about that. And some of you may have to operate without a webcam for a time until you can get one. I know everybody in the world is trying to do what we're doing tonight. And the webcams just got sucked up. I love this one. Any suggestions how to teach on how to teach yoga through Zoom? That's a really good question. How, how would I do some kind of activity class like that? And um, I think I might have mentioned earlier that my granddaughter in England is taking a er, is continuing her Taekwondo class over Zoom. So what? How could you do that? Well, the you're going to have to do something like take your webcam and turn it around and point it outward into your <clears throat> your yoga space. Your uh, out towards your uh, exercise mat where you're normally demonstrating yoga poses. And you need a webcam with a decent microphone. Most of them have pretty good microphones these days, but I like the Logitech webcams. Uh, and if you want a specific uh, recommendation on that, just send me an email. Uh, so you point that out, at, you start your Zoom meeting, you point your webcam out into the room, uh, many webcams can be placed on a little tripod if you want to buy one of those and, and point it out into the room. And then uh, speak and demonstrate as you normally would while your, while your uh, video is, is playing for your students. It's not an ideal circumstance to say the least, but it will work. It will, you can do something with it anyway. I've heard of people teaching Tai Chi that way. So yoga <laughs> will probably work too, and Taekwondo. So uh, that would be a, a way you could uh, try it. I would practice it <laughs> with your students a little bit before I tried to really accomplish much of anything. Indeed, if you're going to be doing Zoom meetings with your students yet and you haven't already started, the first time you get on Zoom with them, don't try to accomplish anything other than just getting on the Zoom and practicing a little bit and exercising the capabilities of Zoom and getting your students used to it. Save any real content delivery for the next time and everybody will be less stressed. Something I've learned the hard way. Should David, may I ask you a question, please? Uh, yeah, if it's related to what we're talking about right now, otherwise I'd really like to take these in the order they were put in. Okay. Okay. Um, should students make sure to download Zoom before the meeting, and aren't they then required to cr create a username and password? No, they don't have to do that. If they're on a computer, they don't even have to download the Zoom app in advance. That will download automatically when they try to open their first Zoom meeting. On a mobile device, a, 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 a smartphone or a tablet or an iPad, they will have to load the Zoom app before they try to enter the meeting. But even on the mobile device, they don't need a username and a password at all. Your students do not need a Zoom account. And they don't need, unless you've gone to some trouble, they don't need a password to get into your Zoom session. You can password protect your Zoom sessions, but I would urge you not to bother. It's just one more thing. One more hurdle for the students to leap to get into your um, into your course. Let me stop my share here for a second since I'm not using that and I can see you better. Um, so no, students don't have to have a Zoom account and they don't have to log in to get into your meetings. Uh, someone was having an echo problem locally. Uh, probably you have too many. Um, uh, you may have your speakers turned up a little too high, or you may um, have more than one microphone or speakers active at the same, or more than one microphone active at the same time. Or it's possible that echo was coming from somebody else's 
uh, having more than one microphone open. It may not have been you at all. So that's just some general uh, things. That's one of the reasons I mute everyone when I'm talking. So, so in case that type of echo effect is happening, I can shut it off. As long as I'm careful about how uh, loud I make my speakers. Uh, how did I share screen while well, I showed you that in the movie? I think that was question was posted before the movie. What is the difference, if any, between Zoom and ConferZoom? Uh, ConferZoom is an organization that provides free Zoom Pro accounts. But those Zoom Pro accounts are just regular Zoom accounts. Uh, there's no difference, really. Zoom is the company that provides this tool. And Confer, the accounts you get from ConferZoom are Zoom Pro accounts that have full function, 300 attendees, unlimited meeting time, and so on. So when you receive an account, a Zoom account from ConferZoom, we sometimes call it a ConferZoom account, but it's just a Zoom account that you didn't have to pay for. Um, how do you choose a background or is that a physical screen behind you? I, I think I showed you that briefly in the um, uh, movie. I can give you more information on that if you want to email me. It's obviously not something you have to do, but it is kind of cool. It's a fun trick. I do have a, I'm really sitting in front of a, Zoom, a, green, a green screen and that makes it work better. But if you just have a blank wall behind you, even if it's not green, this will probably work. And then you can select a, uh, a photo that Zoom provides or that you take and upload yourself to put behind you. There, that one's better. All right. Uh, Ah, your your either your Mac or your Windows desktop is a mess. I can relate to that. So is mine. Can students see, download, or access your desktop? Well, they can see it if you do, if you share your screen and you don't have a window open on top of your desktop. They can see your desktop, but they can't download it or access it or anything like that. Uh, do I need to clean up my desktop before engaging them? Well, it just depends on how embarrassing it is. <laughs> I've learned to live with that embarrassment, but my desktop is, uh, if I share my screen, uh, mine's a mess too. Well, I've, I've had it worse. <laughs> okay. So just depends on how easily embarrassed you are. How do I go back to my video after sharing my screen? Uh, let me share my screen again. Okay, I think I can show you this control bar. I think that does show up. Oh, darn it, it's not. Shoot. When you share your screen, you'll see a little control bar you're at the top of the screen that has most of your Zoom menu in it. And right below that control bar is a red button marked Stop Share. And if you click that button, you stop your screen share. So that's how, that's how you bring yourself back to your video so that people can see you now. Okay. You will be able to save and re-access uh, re this chat later if you save it to your local computer before you leave. If you teach at multiple community colleges, can you only sign up once or do you need to set a Zoom account up for each college you teach at? You can use the Zoom, the confer Zoom account that you get at all at any college. 
in the system. And really any college in California, uh, we have some folks who teach at, uh, at one of our community colleges and at SDSU or UCSD. And I wouldn't certainly have any ethical problems with using your confer Zoom account at any of those institutions because it's all paid for by the state. If you were teaching at, uh, say, DeVry or something like that as well, uh, and you uh, using your confer Zoom account might be a little bit of an ethical issue. But if it's a state school, I wouldn't worry about it at all. And uh, yes, your Zoom Pro confer Zoom account. The question is, as I'm an adjunct lecturer, I teach at several colleges. Uh, is the free uh, Zoom account available at all those? Yes, as long as you're a California Community College faculty member, full or part time, or a staff member, you can get a free confer Zoom account. And you can use it, like I said, at any, certainly at any of the California Community Colleges. And I wouldn't have any ethical concerns about using it at S SDSU or UCSD either, because it's all coming out of the same pot of money ultimately. Our, our state taxes, your, your state taxes now. <laughs> I haven't paid California taxes in two years now. <laughs> That's kind of a nice feeling. Uh, D, 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 D. Okay. Uh, someone asking if I can help them with a Canvas question later. Certainly, probably the best thing to do with that is to send that to me in an email and I'll answer you individually. Does anyone know if Miramar College already has Canvas shells ready to be accessed by faculty? Yes, they do. Any, uh, I'll answer that Canvas question right now because that goes to the heart of using Canvas. Uh, at the SDCCD, every course that is listed as an active course in PeopleSoft automatically gets a shell in Canvas. And if, when you log into Canvas, you should find those shells already there in your, in your Canvas dashboard. And you can use them immediately. You don't have to ask anyone for a shell anymore. And if you have any problems getting into it, contact me. I'll help. How about if you have more than one course and you work in different colleges? Well, if you're working at different colleges within the San Diego Community College District, we only have one Canvas system and all of your courses will show up on that same system, regardless of which um, uh, college that course is offered by. If you're also teaching at Southwestern or uh, Grossmont or whatever, you'd have to access their Canvas systems, which are separate from the SDCCD system to get to your Canvas courses there. But anything at the San Diego district will have a Canvas shell right away. Do we share the meeting ID or join URL for Zoom with students through an announcement? Or is there a way to link contacts up with your Zoom? Well, I, I showed you how to do everything but share it in an, in an announcement. But if sharing your uh, Zoom meeting ID or join URL through an announcement is also a perfectly valid option. So that's, and indeed, if I were trying to get this information to students, I would push it out to them through every communication channel I could find, especially the first couple of times. Uh, and the more channels you use, probably the more students you will have actually attending your meetings. Do you have to schedule meetings? No, you can just start them right away, but you can schedule them if you wish through the Zoom, uh, through the Zoom website. You may notice that I have not said a lot about the uh, Confer Zoom app, the course link in Canvas. Um, 
we've had some glitchy problems with that. So I don't teach the use of it. I try to teach people how to do Zoom and Canvas without using that. But if you are using that and it's working for you, it's perfectly fine. And you can start your Zoom meetings from within that app. You can schedule your Zoom meetings from within that app. But as I said, we've had a lot of people have trouble with that. And uh, it, uh, it puts a limitation on using that app in Canvas, that link in the course menu, puts a, a restriction on you that the email address that you use with Canvas has to be your district email address. And some people don't like to do that because of all the traffic that Canvas generates. And it can, it can fill up your district email account. It can get, the messages can get mixed in. They can be hard to find. But that confer Zoom app in Canvas, the one in the course menu, will not work unless you put, unless you make your district email address your primary email address in Canvas. So that's why I don't teach it in these sessions. Can you go over again how to set up your meeting room once you get into Zoom to set up a meeting time with students? Do we have to save it or is, there auto, is it automatically saved for you to have your own room? Well, you get your own room automatically in Canvas. And let me share my screen or in Zoom. Now I'm <laughs> stumbling, sorry. Uh, let me bring up Zoom here on the, let me bring up the Zoom website. Here it is. Uh, whoops, I'm not signed in here. In this window, there it is. Now it knows who I am. Um, again, to start a meeting in your personal meeting room, go into the meetings tab at zoom.us, go to your personal meeting room and click this button, which will say start meeting when you're, when you're not in a meeting. That puts you into your personal meeting room. Then you share this, your personal access URL and or your meeting ID with your students by emailing that to them or, in, or putting it into a link in Canvas or putting it into an announcement in Canvas. And that will, and of course, you also need to tell your students when you're going to meet. And if you give them the information on when your meeting will be, your next meeting will be, and your access URL or your meeting ID, they will be able to get into that meeting and they will end up in the same room as you. So that's kind of a recap of that. We do have uh, tutorials for that. Let me find that. There we go. Go to this, our open on demand website, search for Zoom tutorials. Let's see. Starting a Zoom meeting and providing students the information they need to join you. That's the tutorial you need. That covers everything I've said tonight three or four different times and ways, but it's a lot shorter <laughs> than going through the entire meeting recording for tonight. Let me put that in the chat tool for everyone. Now the links in the chat tool that tutorial. Thank you, Dave. You're explained clearly and your voice does not put us to sleep. <laughs> That's a very sweet thing, though some of you are looking pretty drowsy right now. <laughs> That's a very sweet thing to say. Thank you. I try to keep, uh, try to keep uh, on task here anyway. Though the later it gets, the harder it gets. Okay, I'm, I'm getting back to my place in the chat tool here. 
And when I get through with the chat tool, I'll let you ask any new questions you have if you haven't already put a question in the chat tool. We did that about subtitling and captioning. I've refrained in the past from using Zoom because it's not fully accessible for some disabled students. I know they can watch later and you can let YouTube sub subtitle for you. Correct. Um, but there's nothing else. But is there nothing else for live participation for disabled students? Yes, there is. And I, I think I covered that and showed you how to request that on the uh, Confer Zoom website. Let me. Actually, I'm not sure I did put that link in. Let me put that in here. But you have to do this five days in advance at minimum. Well, let me go to confer Zoom. Uh, let's go to uh, guides and oh gosh, that was in there just a little while ago. I hope they didn't take that out. Let's see, closed captions, viewing options. This is how you view it. Here we go, live closed captions, how to submit a request. It's not encouraging that they've kind of buried this link, but here's the option. Here's how to submit a request. And I am sending, I'm putting that in the chat tool. Submit live captioning request they're going to have a very hard time keeping up with this so i'd make this early as early as i can there's in the chat tool there's the link to requesting live captioning okay should you use the same meeting id for two different sections of the same class or two different classes Sure, why not? Um, you can use the, your personal meeting room for everything. Occasionally, a student from another section may wander in, but trust me, they'll wander right back out again if they realize the meeting's not for them. Uh, it's I've never had a problem with that. And my meeting out there, ID has been out there in hundreds of emails over the years. And people occasionally wander in, but it's nice. Hi, <laughs> old friends and just deal with it. Okay, let's see. Lots of good back and forth in here. That's great. That's what the chat tool is so good for. You can have kind of side conversations while the presentation's going on and get more work done, multitasking. Good, good. Just a lot of uh, chatty stuff in here. It's great. Where do I find the whiteboard in Zoom? Okay, there is a shared whiteboard built into Zoom. I'm not really enamored of it. It's not, I don't find it that useful. I much prefer the document camera solution. But you can, when you share your screen in Zoom, the, the uh, first thing that comes up is a selection box that asks you what you want to share. And normally you just take the default and go right ahead, but there is an option in that first box to share a shared whiteboard in Zoom. I can show you what that looks like by sharing it. Dee, 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 dee. Share whiteboard. Share. It's just a white screen. You can draw on it. You can try to write on it. 
good luck doing that with a mouse. A graphics tablet will help a little bit, but even that's a lot harder than writing with a pencil on a piece of paper using a document camera like I showed you earlier. Uh, trying to put in math symbols is really, really hard with a mouse and not that much easier with a graphics tablet. So I don't recommend using this, but it is available to you. I can just kill a share there. All right. So you mean they can use the same link for every meeting? Like if we meet Tuesday and Thursday, use the same link? You bet. That way you're sure you all end up in the same room. And that same link will be your personal meeting room link. Okay, here's some stuff I answered during the movie playing. So I'm going to go, I want to shoot past that. And it, I'm doing my best not to miss something here. But if I miss something, don't hesitate to send me an email with the question. And I'll get back to you as soon as I can. How can I make the menu bar show in a show in Zoom? Usually by mousing over the Zoom screen or on a computer or tapping the screen on a mobile device like a smartphone or a tablet. What is the green screen? How can I get one and make a virtual background? And I've watched the videos and I've tried to do that. Um, a green screen is not absolutely necessary to do this virtual background, but it makes it work a lot better. You can um, get green screen, green backdrops from Amazon, and those haven't sold out, <laughs> curiously enough. Um, it's the kind of thing you might find in a photo studio. And a green muslin cloth background that's about six by nine or so, which is probably enough is about, oh, you can get them for less than 20 bucks. Uh, just go to Amazon and I'll put this in the chat tool. Let me see where I am. I'm at, uh, the, the question was put in at uh, 7.30, 7.33. You can go to Amazon, search chroma key which is the name of this technique uh, the virtual background chroma key backdrop i just put that in the chat tool and you can get a green drape to put behind you you can hang it over a door or a, a coat a coat rack or something or for a little more money you can get some stands that will hold it up behind you I think for maybe 35 bucks, as little as 35 bucks, you can get the drop backdrop and some little stands that will hold it up. And you can put it behind you. And that's what I have behind me here in my studio that my wife was uh, kind enough to let me have when I, uh, when I agreed to move to Idaho, which is where she's always wanted to retire. <laughs> she was feeling guilty, so she let me put together this studio. Uh, and here's what my backdrop looks like. And lighting is optional. It helps a little bit, but you probably won't need it. Ambient light would probably be good enough. So there's my backdrop. So that will help. Okay, back up. Can I set up a meeting that I'm the only one in so I can try these things? Yes, that's the best way to practice with Zoom. A Zoom meeting does not have to have attendees in it. It can just be you. And that's the best way to try some of these things. Though sometimes it's a little hard to tell if what you're doing is getting through to your student, or to your, would get through to your attendees. So what I often do when I'm practicing is I start the meeting on my computer and then I join the meeting also through my phone. And you can do both at the same time. And then I look up, and I'm doing that right now. I've got my phone uh, logged into the meeting. 
so I can look over at my phone and I can tell what I'm sending to you. And I can tell if you can see what I'm doing or not. So I can tell that you're only seeing me at this moment and not this window I have up on my screen that Zoom is sending down and not sending down screen, downstream. Okay, okay, close that. Uh, I want to, if I want to lecture the class showing a PowerPoint, how do I control the slides? That's a really good question. I wish I'd thought to show that earlier tonight. Um, uh, but we'll get it in the recording here. All you have to do to show your power, PowerPoint slides while you're sharing and while you're in a Zoom meeting is to share your screen like you would for anything else. Oh, except I accidentally shared my whiteboard again, excuse me. I'll share my computer screen. There's that thing about live closed captions again. And all I have to do here is bring up PowerPoint. Oh shoot, it's been a while since I brought that up. Let me, I have to search for it. Power point, there it is. Yeah, you can see my little Windows menu there. I can just bring up PowerPoint. And you're seeing my screen. Now I can just load a presentation. Maybe full screen that so you can see it better. And there's my PowerPoint presentation. That's my, just my edit view of my PowerPoint presentation. And you can just present from here. Yada, 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 yada. Switch to the next slide by clicking on the slide deck over here. Da, yada, yada, da, da. And continue working your way through the PowerPoint presentation until you're done. And your students will see and hear, see the slides and hear you just as they normally would. And indeed, if you, if they haven't disabled your uh, little video thumbnails, which I have over here somewhere, like, uh, let's see, let me shrink this down a little bit. I'll swamp the screen if I don't do that. You can even put this up beside you so they can see that. So they can see you at the same time. Though I have found strangely that seeing me doesn't really improve their experience with the PowerPoint presentation. Maybe if I was Brad Pitt, it would help. Oh, well, <laughs> that, that train left the station a long time ago. All right, so that's all there is to, uh, presenting a PowerPoint online. And this brings up an interesting point too. Um, if you wanna put your PowerPoint presentations, say in the canvas, so that the students can see the slides, it would be a lot more valuable if you not had, had just not the slides, but your narration and the slides at the same time. And with Zoom, you can record that. You can just open up a Zoom meeting with no one else there, and run through your PowerPoint presentation, or you can just record it during a live meeting, if you prefer, with people in there. And you can record the PowerPoint slides in turn with your narration, and then load, save that video to your local computer or to the Zoom cloud, and load the link to that into Canvas, and your students then can go back and, you, and access your, um, PowerPoint presentation with the narration at any time and not just the slides. So that's a that's a, a value added use of Zoom that you can do. That's that's using Zoom to something called to do something called screencasting. And Zoom is a perfectly good screencasting tool. You can record instructional videos for your students by just running through uh, uh, stuff on your screen while you're recording in Zoom. It's a great, great tool. But Dave, could students show their PowerPoints while they're talking or is, is it only my yes. PowerPoint? Yes, yes. Uh, if you, uh, by default, 
your students can share their screens. They can't share them while you're sharing. Once you, you can maintain control of that by just sharing your screen and they can't bump you off. But if you're not sharing your screen, you can tell them, okay, you share your screen and they can share the screen just like you can and they can bring up PowerPoint and do what I just did. So students can give presentations in class using um, Zoom. They can also give speeches in class. If you're teaching, uh, what is it, uh, uh, 103 speech, you can, the students can, uh, you can mute everyone except the one student. And if that student has a webcam, they can give their speech and everyone else can see and hear it. And then you can let each uh, student in the class in turn do that. So yeah, you can teach speech online if you've got Zoom. And they'll still have the experience of talking to a live audience. They won't be in the same room, which is a little bit of a problem because that's part of the experience, of course, of getting used to do that, getting used to doing that. But it's in some ways, it's even more intimidating to do it online because you know it's like you're sending it out to the cosmos or something, even if nobody else can get into the meeting. So uh, you can do things like that with Zoom, uh, things that were really pretty much out of reach just a few years ago. Uh, they were too hard to do or too expensive or whatever. But now you can teach. There's so many things you can teach online using Zoom that you couldn't before Zoom became widely so, available. So Dave, I have a question. On that note, how do yes. students give a group presentation? How well, you could, you could uh, basically <laughs> what I just said, except there you unmute everybody in the group. Okay. You do have to pick a group leader who would share their screen, or you could let different students share their queen screens sequentially. Mm -hmm. One student could do part of the presentation and share their screen. And then they could stop their screen share and the next student in that group can then share their screen and do their part of the presentation and so on and just sequence right through it. So is there a way for them to, as a group, without necessarily one doing that, since we're trying to, you know, acclimate everybody. So yeah. you had mentioned earlier about maybe just the group members being unmuted and then oh, yeah. you could, do it. You could all, unmute <laughs> only the group members in the participants tool and they could talk but no one else could so how would we do that how would we control that you do that in the participants tool and that's one of those things i can't show you live but um basically in the participants tool you have everybody in the, that's in the meeting listed. And next to everyone in the meeting uh, is a little microphone icon that will show you whether they're muted or not. And in the participants tool, there's a mute all button. So you can mute everyone, and then you can go through and unmute the participants in the group during the presentation selectively, one at a time. And I did show that in that meeting, in that movie earlier. Right. And you would just unmute, and it's pretty obvious just by looking at the participants box how to do that. Uh, you can unmute just those people and let them talk and keep everybody else muted. To be sure that you have control over that, when you mute everyone, a little box pops up and asks you if you're sure you want to do that, because you don't want to do that accidentally. But in that box is an option that can be checked or unchecked that says, allow participants to unmute themselves. If you don't check that box and you mute everyone, no one can talk except you, unless you uh, specifically unmute them in the participants box. Okay, so on another connected question with that is, <clears throat> is there a way for students to meet in or like these groups that, that we do for presentations, can they right. meet in Zoom in multiple groups or would they have to be scheduled for a meeting room for their group to meet? Oh, that's a really good question. I love that. Um, 
it is possible for you to set that up. Okay. You can enable what is called join before host in your account, okay. which basically means that if the students have your personal meeting room ID, they can go in there at any time, even if you're not in there. And they can work together. So they can set up a time among themselves and say, let's go into the meeting room at, at three o'clock today. And everybody click on that link at three o'clock and then we all go in there and then we can all practice. The, in order for them to do that, you do have to set your meeting room up for join before host. Uh, I keep okay, mine. So what does yes. that mean exactly? Would that join before host at a, on a particular day? So how do they no. get to, I don't understand. No, that, that's all the time. Join before host is either uh, okay. all the time or none. So that's a setting. That's a setting in Zoom. And I'll okay. show you how to do that. Okay. Okay. Let me show you that. And I do have a tutorial online for this too. Let me get rid of PowerPoint here. And um, let me pull up Zoom. And if you go into your Zoom account on the Zoom website again, then if you really control your Zoom account, you have to be familiar with going into the, your Zoom account through zoom.us. And you can go to your settings tab here on the left. And this option is actually fairly close to the top of the screen. Let's see. Well, I guess that's not as close as I remembered. Let's see. Pulling. Did I miss it? Sorry, just a second. This video. Join. Yeah, there it is. I went right by it. Join before host. Okay, the first, and this is a little, you'd think if you just set this, on it would work but sometimes it doesn't but the first thing you do is you have to turn on join before host that's not on by default then in order to convince zoom that you really mean business and this is a little bit of a glitch in the zoom interface you have to go back to your meetings tab again and through the Zoom account here, you have to use this button that says schedule a new meeting. You can always use this as well to schedule your meetings in advance, but you don't have to. You can just start a meeting in your personal meeting room anytime. But for this purpose, you have to schedule a meeting. It doesn't have to be a meeting you're actually going to use. You can just be a dummy meeting that you can get rid of later, but it has to be, a, you have to schedule a meeting. All you have to do is put a meeting topic in. You can just take whatever default settings are here for dates and times and so on and go down to the bottom of the screen and you'll see some meeting options and make sure enable join before host is checked. And then save this meeting that activates join before host. You only have to ever do that once. And Zoom will now remember to, when you ever you schedule a, a meeting or whenever you, well, that's not true. Zoom will remember that so that if your students click on your personal meeting room link, um, they will automatically be dropped into your meeting without you having to be there. And so, then later you can go back to your meetings <coughs> and you can delete that meeting um, if you no longer need it. Okay, anyway. but how do the students, how do they set up the meeting for themselves? All What's they have to do, all they have to do is go to wherever you sent them your personal meeting room link like an email or an announcement right. in Canvas or a link in Canvas, all they have to do is go and find that link and click on it and they'll go right into your meeting without you being there. Okay, but the way that you had this set up was for a meeting for a particular time span or do we? Oh, no, no. This, I just made this to activate this option. 
this is not you're not going to use that scheduled meeting i can just oh no i don't want to end um it's, so, it thinks I'm in this meeting right now. So this this means nothing. All your once you get this set up so that your meeting room, your personal meeting room, is set up to allow join before host. All right. the student has to do is go into say go into Canvas and click click, the link. click your the, the Zoom mm -hmm. link you put in there uh -huh. and go in. And I can't show you because we're already in this right, meeting. Right, right. But they'll just get dropped right into that meeting room. They don't have to look up any schedules or anything like that. This meeting room effectively becomes open all the time if you set it to join. If you set the option join before host. Okay, so, so even even though you time. set it, so even though you set it for a particular day and time, it'll remain uh, open. Uh, yeah, it'll remain <laughs> open. That. That meeting that I scheduled right. is meaningless. That was just a, a, right, a, a tricking Zoom. I'm tricking Zoom into accepting right. the join before host option. Okay. And that's a glitch. I shouldn't have to do that. And I didn't used to have to do that. But lately that's gotten to be the case. So um so all this let me make sure I understand. So because we set the if we set the link up in Zoom, like in um, Canvas like you showed us, then at yeah. any point in time, each group can go back to that link, click that mm -hmm. link, and then schedule their own day and time. To they meet don't have to another. schedule. They don't have to schedule anything. <clears throat> okay, they can just, just utilize it. All, they just uh, I have to all click on that link at more or less the same time. Right. right, and then they can meet and collaborate and connect with each other, just as if Correct. they were in a library or something like that. Correct. So okay. they can use it for homework, study sessions. Oh, wonderful! Or just just to get in contact with one another. You may have noticed tonight if you entered this meeting tonight before I did, you were able to get in and talk with the other people who were in the room right. and so on, just like you would if you walked into a classroom before the instructor mm -hmm. arrived. Right. And you could talk to one another. If you set your Zoom meeting room up to have to be. Uh, to have the property of join before host, like I just showed you, um, then they can use it that way at any time. And again, that that meeting that I scheduled was just a way of getting Zoom's attention. You don't actually ever have to use that scheduled meeting. That's not part of the process. That that's a really big that that's a really big um, a really huge thing because a lot of students are really afraid about. How are they going to do this? And for us as faculty, that alleviate, alleviates a lot of stress. Oh, Thank I you. agree. Thank you so much. That's why I always set my <laughs> personal meeting room up that way so that people can use it at any time when I'm not there. And people, and I can tell when they do that because I get an email if somebody goes into the meeting without me. And I can see that happening all the time. I see people coming in and using it and dropping out, just practicing and so on. And that's wonderful. I agree. That's a huge added value for Zoom. But you do have to go through these little hoops to um, to get it to work. And so you don't have to remember everything I just said about that. I do have a tutorial for that very thing online. Let me find that. Way too many meetings open here, or when too many windows open. Here we go. If you go to the, our on demand site and you search for Zoom, <clears throat> here it is using your Zoom personal meeting room and setting up join before host. And that tutorial we'll go through everything I just went through with you. Wonderful. Thank you. So you will, it takes a couple of tries. If you have any trouble with it, email me. Great question. And that's something I did want to talk about. Now that's in the recording. I played a video. Students could hear me, saw the video, but couldn't hear the video. When you share your screen, you, uh, as you saw in that movie, you get a little screen share options box that pops up 
before your screen share actually becomes active. And in that box, you can select which screen, if you have multiple screens, you can select which one you want to share, things like that. But in the lower left-hand corner of that share, pre-share box that comes up, there's an option to share your computer's sound, a little checkbox. If you're going to be playing a video or an audio file during your Zoom meeting, you have to share, you have to click that option before you share your screen. That will ensure that the students can hear the audio that is playing through your computer on a video or audio file, in addition to your microphone. So that's an option that you set up when you're sharing your screen. Where do we find this recorded session to review it later? On our on-demand video website, there is a link at the top of the screen called Workshop Archives. You can find them all here. Is the Zoom folder on my computer automatically made or do I have to make a Zoom folder myself? It's automatically made. If you are saving recordings, to your local computer, Zoom will automatically create that Zoom folder inside your documents folder. You don't have to create it. Uh, somebody's asking about breakout rooms. That's a little bit of a um, an advanced topic for this hour of the evening. <laughs> and I can't really show you that well online uh, in a Zoom session like this. So there are tutorials on the Zoom website on how to use that. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, Kathy, uh, emailing that question to me, I will send you the link to the information about the breakout rooms. And yes, they're cool. And it's something I practiced with before I tried to use them, but I can send you information you need to get started on that. Thank you, Dave. You're certainly welcome. Can we review any of your previously made Canvas overviews on YouTube? If so, how do we find it? They are in this on-demand website. Just go to the workshop archives. And uh, there's the last one I record. That's the last one uh, before this morning. And I'll have this morning's up by tomorrow morning in this same place. Here's the uh, Q&A session I did on uh, Sunday. <laughs> or Saturday, Saturday, that, that recording's there too. So I try to put everything in these workshop archives and I try to get it up as soon as I can. Dave, can you send me the link to delete YouTube postings of other recordings? <clears throat> that depends on uh, where you put them. Uh, Cassandra, if you're still online, you may want to send me that question with a little more information in email. Good luck to everyone and stay healthy indeed. If we want all of these things we built in our Canvas shells to transfer to our next class or semester, let's just hope we have a next semester. Do we start from scratch with each new class semester CRN? Oh no, absolutely not. You don't have to build your class shells in Canvas uh, more than once. And since I, I swore I'd answer all these questions, I'll answer this Canvas question too. Uh, let me go to Can, let me find Canvas here. I've got it up somewhere. Sorry. There is a drawback on having three screens. You can forget where you put stuff. <laughs> oh, there it is. There's Canvas. All right. Let's say you have a nice new blank shell in Canvas. For your next semester. This one's, oh, this one's not quite blank anymore. But let me make it that way. Let me let me make this into something that would look like your blank shell. 
I'm not sure you have that as faculty, you have that option, because it's a dangerous option for obvious reasons. Okay, here's a blank canvas shell. Let's say this is next semester's shell, and you've built out your this semester's shell, and everything's good to go, and you want to bring your content forward from last semester. You go into the blank shell, into the new shell, the one that doesn't have the content in it yet, and you click settings. And you go over here on the settings page to the taskbar on the right, and you select import course content. If the content is in a Canvas course on our system that you are the teacher of, but it was just last semester, you select for content type, you select copy a Canvas course. Then you will see a list of your current, uh, your classes that you have taught or and been enrolled, uh, that you have taught and you'll be able to select from that list. I'm in so many courses, it can't display them all here, so I have to select, I have to search for one. But you can just select last semester's course, and you'll know, because it'll have last semester, it'll say, um, it'll have last semester's designation, like winter, uh, or, uh, excuse me, I'm, no quarter system anymore, like fall <laughs> or spring or whatever what the last semester was. And it'll also have the CRN from the last semester and the name. So you can pick that up. Choose the co right course to copy co uh, content from. Then just click all content to take everything that was in that shell and then click import. And wait a few minutes, and your content from last semester will be all of it will be moved forward into this semester shell. And you can go in and clean up dates and times and things like that, and you're ready to go. You never should have to develop the same Canvas course shell twice, unless you just decide that well, you know, this is a little maybe after you're using it for a couple of years, I could it could use a major refresh. I may, I may be better off just starting from scratch but that might never happen. There's no reason you should have to develop a Canvas course shell from scratch more than once. Otherwise, nobody would ever use Canvas. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> um, can you give us the online on-demand video site? Again, that is sdccdolvid.org, and I, I put that in the chat tool earlier. I'll put it in again, what the heck, because that's pretty important, because that's where so many of these resources are going to be, sdccdolvid.org, on-demand tutorials from SDCCD. Okie dokie. Oh, we're getting down, we're getting down there. We may be out of here before 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> but I still got 18 of you with me. Oh, you are, you're hardy, I tell you. I appreciate it. Lots to mull over. Boy, you're right there. But we're here to help. And just remember, your first Zoom meetings with your students are not going to go perfectly. Don't put that kind of pressure on yourself. You'll get better as you practice, but your students will appreciate it. And I had several people telling me this morning, oh, I was so nervous about this. And then I got on there with my students and they were excited and I was excited and we were just having fun and, every, and it worked. It was more fun than being in the classroom in some ways because it was new, I guess. But people have been so worried about this when they find out that it really does work, uh, even if it maybe doesn't work exactly the way you'd like it to the first time, uh, it does work. And you can really communicate effectively and uh, pleasantly with your students. Uh, and if, when you have problems, send me email messages asking how to fix the problem the next time and just move forward. Don't look back because you're not gonna be perfect right off the bat. I'm, hey, as you have ample evidence tonight, I've, I've been doing this since Zoom was first available. 
and I've been doing something like this for 30 years and I'm still not perfect and obviously I'm going to die that way and um <laughs> and I still get I still get things done you don't have to be perfect to get things done wise man once told me perfect is the enemy of good if you worry too much about perfect you'll never get good uh, all right, did that, did that. Oh, you're all so sweet. My picture is too big. How I do, do I decrease the size? I'm not sure what the context on that might be. Uh, if, you, if that was your question, you may want to send me an email with a little more information and I'll try to, to fix it. I'll try to deal with that for you. I've had a basic Zoom account for some time. I tried to get a pro version by going to the ConverZoom website. But when I put in my account info, it auto reverts back to my basic account. I can't figure out how to get the upgrade. Well, be sure to put your district email address in when you submit that form. And if you have a current free account that does not have your uh, district email is the login on it, then they'll just make you a new account. Mm. If you, if you do have, a, if your free account currently uses your district email as the login, uh, when they make your new account, your old account will just automatically upgrade to pro. They'll be merged automatically. Okay, um, I, I, I did set up my free account with my district email. Good. Uh, and that, and it, it keeps reverting back to the basic. It's, uh, I can't seem to get out of that loop. Uh, well, it, it won't be a pro account immediately. They have to set that up. And it's taken them three or four days in some cases now. Oh, okay. I didn't realize it. That much in the so life. that should resolve itself. Have you gotten the email back from Confer Zoom yet? No. Okay, well, they just haven't gotten around to it yet. That's no. why it's still a free account. Okay. Uh, that, that was my, because I didn't want to get every, kept at that 40 minute limit. Yeah, I understand. But in the meantime, if you do get cut off at 40 minutes, you can just warn your students that that might happen and tell them that, okay, if we get cut off, just join the meeting, the same meeting again, and you can just start the meeting up again right away and do another 40 minutes. They don't tell you that. <laughs> okay. So right. it's not the end of the world. It's, it's disruptive and it's not ideal, and you want your pro account so you don't have to deal with that, but in the meantime, you can get by. Okay, thanks. With the free account. You bet. Yeah, I've, I've been... Uh, uh, getting by with things on Zoom for a long time. I, I know a lot of the dodges. So and sometimes you just have to get, take whatever they give you. Thank you. I feel a little better about this new technology. Yeah, but you won't really, thank you, but you won't feel really good about it until you practice. And some of that practice will have to be with your students, given that we're just kind of been dropped in the pot here. But your students will understand. They know that this is new to everyone and that they're that nobody planned to do this. And if we we planned to do something like this, we would have taken at least a year in advance to prepare. And here we have to do it in three weeks. Yeah. Or less, it's been less than that. So it ain't going to be perfect. And I don't think your students will expect it to be. So just jump in, try it. If it doesn't work, ask for help, try it again and keep trying to get it right. And you just, that's the only way this is going to work under these circumstances. So don't feel bad if it, if it doesn't work perfectly the first time, goodness gracious. Uh, is it possible for students to show PowerPoints and talk to me? I, we just covered that for speech classes, yeah. So you really can teach speech online with Zoom, whether the students are giving PowerPoint presentations or they're just doing speeches you know, live without visuals. You can do it online. 
So, Dave, so Dave, on yes. that note, would it would that be be a function of them sharing of their yes, screen? Well, their if they're if they're doing PowerPoints uh, presentations, yes, they would have to share their screens. And then, uh, so I would mute everybody else, and then allow right. them to share their PowerPoint, um, share their screen, and then that's where they'll pull up their PowerPoint. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And it works like a shot, and they'll they'll chances are they'll get into it pretty easily. Uh, I guess there's the, more than one speech teacher left. Pardon? I guess yeah, there's more, more than one speech teacher, teacher left. Yeah. I'm not surprised. That's a that's got to be a, an intimidating thing to try to do that online. But Zoom is the only tool I know that would really make that work. Thanks, Dave. And and the students may be happier about doing it that way than actually doing it in the classroom. Okay, and- May I ask you this question that I wanna clarify before the meeting is over? Uh, uh, certainly, I'm, I'm almost at the bottom of the chat tool here. We're getting oh, okay. very close. Okay, I'll wait. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Okay, when you upload the recorded MP4 video to YouTube, it's just the audio and video without the captions. Um, uh, th I think I came in in the middle of this conversation, but yes, there's a separate caption file that you can upload. So you either got to have your YouTube recaption it automatically or upload the VTT file and attach it, correct? Yeah, you can do that. You can upload caption files into YouTube kind of redundant since the ca closed captions are automatic in Zoom. Well, they're automatic in YouTube too. And the YouTube automatic captions are actually a little better usually than the Zoom automatic captions because Zoom is the company that invented automatic captions on videos. Uh, so what I do is just upload to YouTube and let YouTube caption it. Then I look through the captions to make sure they're not, they're <coughs> not egregious problems in them. but if you're putting Zoom recordings up on either the Zoom cloud or the or on YouTube, <clears throat> there's no realistic way that you can um, <clears throat> edit those captions completely because these meetings can be hours long. And let me tell you, if you were trying to try to edit the captions for a Zoom, a Zoom recording on either the Confer Zoom cloud or on YouTube. Editing captions for a two hour uh, seminar would take you at least a total, of at least three to four hours. And we just don't have that kind of time. That's not scalable. And can we, uh, is that a problem? Well, we'd like to be able to edit those captions. But there was today, I saw a, a news item. There has been guidance issued by the Department of Education to say that nothing in accessibility regulations should preclude a, an educational institution from putting their courses online using Zoom or Canada or any other similar tool. And that is guidance from the top. Those are the people that are going to uh, enforce this. Now, I don't think much of Trump's, oh, I'm not going to get into politics, but I haven't been <laughs> impressed with Betsy DeVos, the current education secretary. But in this, I agree with her. That would be an absurd overreaction. Nothing in the ADA states that uh, you can't, do this at this point in time. You've got to make your best effort. But those YouTube captions, even though they're not perfect, are good enough right now. And that is official from the Department of Education. Anybody gives you any static about it, you can refer them to Betsy DeVos, I guess, and I'm sure they'll enjoy the experience. Okay, well, Dave, sorry, I got a little heated, heated about that. <laughs> yes. Dave, this is Sandra. I posted that question. Um, hey, are, Sandra. <laughs> Hi there, oh, long time. You're a, you're a stalwart. Thanks so much for being in the meeting and for, pub, and for posting. Yes, what did you have no to problem. say? I'm sorry. 
usually our files are shorter. Um, we're doing shorter sessions. Like I did a flex and it was about maybe half an hour and I was trying to update the captions because a lot of the words that I'm saying are lingo and like if I'm saying EBSCO, it's not gonna catch Jargon. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna catch yeah. it. So I just wanted to know what the best practice was because I had it on the cloud, it was already captioned, but I had to go through right. and try to edit. When I tried to do it that way, it wouldn't save my caption edits. So then I decided, well, hey, I'll just download it to my computer and then upload it to YouTube. <laughs> And I was just trying to figure out if it was better to have YouTube caption it from there or upload yeah, that GPT so. file and attach it. No, I, I think YouTube will do a little bit better job anyway. Though the Confer Zoom automatic caption is surprisingly good. But the YouTube, like I say, YouTube invented that technology. So I expect theirs to be a little better. And not only that, with YouTube, you can you can get captions in fifty languages. Oh, nice. On on the Zoom cloud, you get English. As so far as I know, I, I, so. So just to upload the MP4 and then just have YouTube do it, and then you can edit yeah, it. Let YouTube want. do it, and okay. then go into YouTube and edit the captions if you need to. Okay. And I can understand how that could be a problem. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Oh, good. It's so good to hear from you. Thanks for being here tonight. No problem. Thank you very much. Uh, if your attendees have a question during the presentation, how can they wave their hand? Um, the raise hand tool, or is it, it's in the participants box for them. If they click on the participants box or tap on it, there's an option in there to raise their hand. That appears in your participants box as a little raised hand symbol. That hand. <laughs> Sorry. And um, if you're keeping track of your participants box, you will see that, but that's hard to do sometimes when you got so many, so many balls in the air and you're doing a presentation. So that is a, a uh, not a great tool in Zoom, mainly because. Uh, as near as I can tell, there's no audible notification if somebody raises their hand. And that would alert you to the fact that there's somebody had raised their hand. Maybe there's a way in Zoom to turn that on, but I haven't found it yet. And so, so Dave, uh, when that happens, let me, uh -huh. so Dave, when that, when that happens, do you go into participants and unmute them? Yes, you can. Okay. So that you yeah, can respond. Uh, That's how you it, it, if it's appropriate at that moment, <clears throat> maybe it's right. at a moment when you you can't stop because you're right in the middle of a thought and you know that everybody will get lost if you. Do. <clears throat> but yeah, you can go back and and do that. But quite frankly, what I ask people to do is just wait till I get to the end of the thought and then just speak up. And if I can't handle it right then, I'll tell you. And we'll go on and then I'll know that I need to g come back and, and deal with that for you later on rather than worrying about the little raised hand tool and so on. I'd rather have somebody just pipe up for a second and say, can you explain this later? And then that's fine. And, and so I, then I, that means that you would have to, that means you would have to set it so they can unmute themselves, correct? That's right. That's right. And I, In order to and I, that try, to, I try to do that whenever I have a session, especially if there's less than a, you know, 50 or 60 people in the session, or if I have a very well-behaved group like you all were tonight, I've left the mics unmutable the whole time and nobody's uh, abused it. And thank you for that. And it just works better for everybody if, if everybody could just get along that way. But there will be times when uh, maybe you have one or two people or one or two students in the class. I certainly don't see that happen much with faculty, but with one or two students who maybe are just too disruptive, uh, you may have to keep it muted and not allow them to unmute themselves, but hopefully not. It's just so much of a, such a better experience for everyone if you can give people the option to unmute themselves and point out something. And, and I do that partly for self-preservation too because sometimes I'll make a mistake in the middle of a Zoom meeting. I mean, there's, there's a lot of balls in the air here and I'll drop one sometimes and 
forget to share my screen. That's my favorite trick. Or forget to start the recording. And I've so some people have learned that about me and they'll remind me in the chat tool or or right off the bat in the session, did you start the recording? And I really appreciate that, by the way. <laughs> but um, it can give your attendees a way to let you know if there's a problem in the meeting that you haven't noticed. And that's, that's just priceless uh, for the host because nobody's perfect. And no many, matter how many times you've done this, and I have done thousands of Zoom meetings over the years, you still make mistakes. Somehow my name on my student's screen shows as mom. mom. Do you have any idea how that happened? <laughs> Do you have any idea how that happened? Actually, I see you labeled as Kathy Harlow. I know, but, but they see me as mom. They got kicked out. I said, well, maybe it should be grandma, you know? <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> but how could that happen, Dave? Uh, when, if you enter a, the session in a certain way, I'm trying to remember what it is, it, it will ask you for a name and it will take whatever you type in. And that might have happened at some point, and Zoom may have remembered it for some reason. But you can always rename what your uh, label is under the, your little video window by going into gallery view and right-clicking on your little box and selecting okay. rename. And you can put up there what you wish it to be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank can you, you say that again? Dave, can you say that again, please? Can you just yeah. say that again? You, you go in to, to rename what appears under your video window in Zoom. Uh, go into gallery view where you get the Hollywood Squares kind of display and right click or control click on a Mac on the, uh, the rectangle that has your video or your name in it. And select the option to rename that from the little menu that pops up and then you can type in what you want to appear there let's see i could can i do that from here yeah like in any time you see your video thumbnail up on the screen you can right click on it and rename yourself because zoom knows who you are and as the host you can rename anyone else so if one of your one of your uh favorite students comes in and names themselves something obscene, you can go in and you can rename it. Yes, I'm paranoid. I've, I've seen too many things happen in Zoom meetings. Well, it could have that's made only, them. That's only happened once. <laughs> could have a student done that to me? Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, that's where it came from. One of, it could be that one of your colleagues may have renamed you. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past them because I always have somebody who's been through Zoom session or Zoom trainings before start using the the annotation tool during a screen share and start drawing, you know, happy faces on the screen and stuff like that. Fortunately, when you're sharing your screen, you can disable that tool so that people can't do that. So there's always a jokester out there. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. Okay, can you use the underline and circle tools during PowerPoint presentations? How, so you, you save the recorded videos, it's saved automatically. Uh, yeah, it's part, it becomes part of the recording. And yes, you can do that. When using the document cam, how do you switch to it and then back to the screen? Okay, that's two different questions. Let me take both of those. If while you're presenting in, um, Zoom, if you're sharing your PowerPoint, uh, I am sharing my screen, so let me bring PowerPoint back up. Now let's say I'm in the, in the middle of a PowerPoint slide and I want to circle a bullet to emphasize it. I have, when I'm, and I can't show this to you dynamically, or I can't share this, but when you're sharing your screen, 
at either at the top or bottom of your screen, you have a little control bar <coughs> that um, you can use while you're screen sharing. It's a subset of your Zoom menu that you get when you're not sharing your screen. But it's always there. And one of the options in it is called annotate. It's got a little marker icon on it. I wish I could show you this. I'd have to screencast this and, and play the video back. And I don't think you want to wait for me to do that tonight. But I'll describe it. And if you want more, um, a more uh, permanent tutorial on this, email me that question and I'll, that, that'd be a good screencast to have online in our online video site. So I'll, I'll do that as quick as I can and get it to you. But the quick answer is you click on annotate in your share control bar and select draw and just pick a little drawing tool. And now while you're sharing, you can circle that bullet or you can draw arrows to it or you can draw smiley faces or whatever. And that appears to everyone. I, yeah, the, see on my phone, that is, uh, I'm not, my phone's not keeping up anymore. I hope you're seeing that. So yeah, that, that's, that's great. Cause that, this looks almost like screencast-o-matic. Yeah, yeah. Very simple. Right. But has the same right. kind of capability. And then that becomes a part of the recording. And even if you go back and erase those later using the eraser tool in the annotation bar, take those out, they'll still be a part of the recording. Wonderful. And Thank are, you. are a part of this recording. So yes, you can do that. Thank you. Wonderful. You bet. Let me know, practice that, and let me know if you have any trouble with it. Okay, no, no problem. Um, and lots of good wishes. Thank you all so much. You're so sweet. Uh, hi, just wanted to make sure this isn't a recording. <laughs> no, this is live, not Memorex. But tomorrow it will be a recording. Uh, and... Again, Kathy, thank you very much for the kind thoughts. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, Dave, don't don't forget to, to show us how to, with the doc, document cam, how do you oh, switch? Oh, thank you, thank you. Well, I was about to forget that. And then come back. Thank you. That's why you leave the mics open, if you possibly can. Uh, when using the document cam, Sorry about that, Takima. When you're using the document cam, how do you switch to it and then back to the screen? All right, most of these document cameras come with a little application that will display what the document camera is seeing on your screen. And if you are sharing your Zoom screen at that time, excuse me, your attendees will see that. So it's, it's not a complicated, the, ten, the tendency here is to overthink this. It's just something else that you can share on your computer screen. You don't have to change any of your Zoom settings or do anything special in Zoom to make this happen. All you do as far as Zoom is concerned is share your screen. And then you bring up the application that, sh that shows the cam what the camera is seeing in, uh, and let me see if I have that running. Yes, I do still have it running down here. I keep this running all the time when I'm presenting, just in case. I still have that. So, how do, you do, so how do you do that, Dave? If, <laughs> let's say, you're doing a PowerPoint and you're, you're lecturing, and then you want to refer, let's say, to a document, right? Um, right. That's on the doc camp. So, how does how do you switch from the PowerPoint you're working with to the document that's okay. that's with the doc cam and then go back? Right. Okay. Well, I'm in here. I'm in PowerPoint, and I'm in the middle of a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Like, be prepared. Better than shut up on the screen. There. <laughs> that seems a little aggressive. <laughs> but uh, okay. So I'm in the PowerPoint. 
how do I bring up my document camera image now? Well, if I already have that application running down here in my taskbar down below, there you can see it right there. Is that over scanning a little bit? It's, you can barely see that on the shared screen, but I do have this document camera application running. I can just find it in my taskbar at the bottom of the screen and click on it and up it comes right over top of the PowerPoint. I may have to refocus the camera or something like that for a second, but uh, no big deal. On the other hand, if I haven't got it running already and I'm in the middle of my PowerPoint, I can just go over here to my Windows button or my, or my um, taskbar on the bottom of the Mac and I can find that piece of software in my uh, the icon for that piece of software either in my taskbar or in the Windows menu and click on it and bring it up fresh and then maybe if I do that the reason I keep this running is that if I do that I have to go on this piece of software I have to go and re uh, invert it and flip it around so that people can actually see it right side up and and not mirrored and maybe i can i'll need to zoom in a little bit or something to see something i i can leave this all set up and just leave this application running while i'm doing everything else and just minimize it when i don't want it anymore so the minimize buttons on the right upper right and on windows and the upper left on the mac just minimize that and then i can bring it back up again anytime i need it so that's how you switch back and forth between whatever else you're doing and the document camera. So is it essentially a picture, Dave? It's just, it's just a picture, yeah. Okay, so but let's it's say- it's a live picture. It's a live right. picture. Right. So let's say, let's say this is a book instead of your phone, right? You're right. Let's say you yeah, that's a great way to do it. And so let's say you want to show several pages of images. So right. would you just, so would you need to take those images before the meeting or can oh. you in the, in the midst of the meeting, since they're a picture, how do, how do you do that? You flip it to the next page and then it automatically takes it as a picture. I'm just, I just put the book on the uh, document camera and okay. in this case, this is a thick book. So I need to mount the document camera a little higher to really make this work. But right. I just turn the page. Oh, okay. The old fashioned way. So it's almost so like nothing, the camera that- Nothing complicated. You just put the book down and you turn the page. Okay. And the document camera sees everything. Okay, so now- below it. Mm -hmm. So now if this, so let's say the doc, the pictures are from a book or resource that the students don't have in front of them. So for mm -hmm. them to go back to it, they would need to relook at the recording, correct? Correct. If they wanted to look at it more uh, in depth and take more time reading it or something, correct? Right, because they can always pause the recording. Oh, okay. Play back to the recording. And they can sit there and read the chapter on the page on the book. So even if I continue lecturing, they can pause that that part and still li listen to the lecture, or does it pause everything? No, it pauses everything. Okay. And they would then read the book without you talking in the background. <laughs> right. And then when they were ready, they could start up the playback again and go to the next page of the book and pause it again. I have had people actually who were having trouble getting textbooks to their students, eBooks. Right. I've had people propose doing that as a way of providing the eBook to the students. Right. Just make a separate Zoom recording that's nothing but you going through the book. Oh, okay. And, and turning the pages one at a time. And okay. that way the students can go in and play that recording back and read the book. Wow. Think about That's it. That's a great idea. That's really beating the system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Thanks, Dave. Thank you so much. And you could do the same thing, of course, with an ebook. If you if you if you weren't using a physical book, you could if you had an ebook version of your textbook, you could just throw that up on your screen and go from page to page and let the students then play back the to the recording and view it page by page that way too. So it's um with a, a little bit of larceny in your heart on behalf of your students, a little ingenuity uh, and, uh, and a certain lack of shame, you can do all sorts of things <laughs> with Zoom and document camera. Uh, while maintaining reasonable good taste. <laughs> so, great questions tonight. Thank you. Oh, let's see where I am. Anybody else has put anything in? Well, somebody said this was fun. They they obviously have a very low fun threshold. <laughs> but I thank you very much for that. What, so, uh, last one that I see here. So, when I schedule a meeting, should I always choose personal meeting room? Yeah, I think so, yes. I, use, I usually schedule a meeting and I get a lot of emails from Zay, Zoom saying your meeting participants are waiting for you. Yeah, that will happen if you, if you set your Zoom <laughs> personal meeting room to be um, available to users when you're not there. Every time somebody joins that room without you being there, you get an email. Dave, that's my question though. I'm sorry. I said that's my question. I get a lot of emails from Zoom saying you have a scheduled meeting. Your participants are waiting, and I don't have any meeting because oh, I have God. I have chosen meetings and then schedule a meeting instead of um, a personal meeting room. Do you think that's why? Uh, are you say you're not using your personal meeting room or you are? No, no, I I have not. I didn't know. It says schedule oh, a meeting and I, I schedule the meeting. That's something to do with the Zoom scheduling app then. I don't know what might be causing that. You showed us though. That's when I want to ask you the question. You showed us a schedule a meeting or then you said always uh, choose personal meeting room instead. Yes. You, I, I always use my personal meeting room Got it. Thank for you. everything, and even when I do, and when I do, when mm -hmm. I, when somebody joins that person, that meeting without me being there, I get an email. So I, I get a lot of Zoom emails from Zoom, and unless I'm curious about who might be in there, I just ignore it and delete. Okay. Got it. And um, thank you. But occasionally, when I see that, I'll just, I'll be in the, uh, not be in the middle of something. I'll just. There's a, there'll be a link in that message that will take you right into your meeting room and you can go in and see who's there and talk to them and so on. Because in my case, it's always uh, one of you, the faculty, and it's always nice to talk. And if I have a few minutes, I'll just do that. Uh, you can ensure, and I probably should have mentioned this earlier, you can ensure that no matter how you start a Zoom meeting, it will use your personal meeting room. You can do that by going to your, uh, that ain't it, sorry, there we go. You can go to your meetings Yes. in uh, settings in Zoom. And, then and you can schedule. go to settings. And you can, uh, again, this is meeting, uh, this is settings for your Zoom account okay. at zoom.us. You scroll down and you can set these two options right here. Use personal meeting ID when scheduling a meeting and use personal meeting ID when starting an instant meeting. Mm -hmm. And if you set both of those on, no matter how you start the meeting, whether you start it in Zoom or if you use the Confer Zoom app in Canvas and you go and you start the meeting and schedule the meeting from there, or start the meeting immediately from there, you will always use your personal meeting room. 
So just setting those two meetings, those two settings on will ensure, virtually ensure that your students and you will always end up in the same meeting room. Well, we, I, I, I do. I should have mentioned that earlier. Even with when I clicked on schedule a meeting, my students were ready. I was ready. I I told you yesterday that I had a good good uh, Zoom meeting yesterday. Right. Remember? Right. Yeah. Yes. So but, those may be those may be set for you already. Um. I just clicked on schedule a meeting instead of um, personal meeting room. Where, yeah, where did you click schedule a meeting then? Um, on this, when you open Zoom and oh, try uh, to see. in the Zoom website? No, no, it's just um, what I or did. In, was, camp, in the Zoom app. Yeah. Okay, so when I scheduled my meeting, I, uh, I copied and pasted the URL in my email to my students. Your personal meeting room URL. No, no. Okay, let me tell you again. Let me let me tell you okay. how I started. That uh, okay. I think I know what you're saying, and that that can backfire on you, because if you don't get the right link or something, you're in um, in the long term, you're much safer if you use your personal meeting room for everything. Hmm. Your students will never end up in the wrong meeting that way. You you can be lucky some of the time and not others, but if you use your personal meeting room ID, you don't have to be lucky. It'll always work. Your students will always end up in the same meeting as you. And I've I've learned to do that from painful experience over the years. Hmm. So I recommend setting everything to use your personal meeting room. And then no matter where you schedule or how you start the meeting, it will be in your personal meeting room and the students will have the link. Because students, what will happen is if you have a different meeting ID each time, students will go back and they'll find an old email that had your link in it and they'll try to use that. And they'll end up in a meeting room that doesn't exist anymore. Oh my goodness. And if your meeting ID never changes, it doesn't matter where the students find that join link that you sent out, it'll always still work. That's why I can send out that meeting link uh, that, or Mary can send out those meeting links in that email every week and always use the same one. And if somebody doesn't have this week's email, if they go back to last week's email and pick up and click on that link, they'll still mm -hmm. end up in here. There's no way it can fail. And so otherwise, it will occasionally yeah. fail. Click on the um, use personal meeting room. So the blue is not on. If well, I click on it, if you if you want to proof yourself against any problems like that, go into your Zoom account at Zoom. Go to the settings tab, like I you see that. right now. Good, and go down and set these two settings to on. They're right near the top. They're just like barely below the line. I see that. Set, use personal meeting ID when scheduling a meeting and use personal meeting ID when starting an instant meeting. Set both of those to on. So when it's brown, it's on? I'm no, when it's blue. Move. Yeah. Now when it's the blue, little, it's on. The, if it's blue, it's on. I know, yeah. it's Because it, you clicked on it and I thought, I have to click on make it brown because the brown is not on. Oh no, 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 no. I was just showing you the process of Okay, 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 it got on it. Off. You so can it turn it on and off. But if it's blue, it's on. But yeah, if it's yeah, that's blue, what I thought. If it's blue and the white circle is to the right, it's on. I know. If yeah, it's yeah. gray and the white circle is to the left, it's off. Of course. So just make sure you're... those two are on and you're golden. You will never have Got your it. students end up in one room and you in another, ever. Thank you. Okay, good. Got it. All right. What a great meeting. Thank you so much.
and it's only 10 o'clock. <laughs> Great job, Dave. Great job. Thank you so much. Very Thank good you. job. Thank you. Thanks okay. for hanging in there. And uh, good luck tomorrow. And let me know how it goes. Okay. I'd love to hear. And I, it was wonderful uh, this morning, Baju, you sharing your story in the in the Canvas meeting about uh, how well it went for you. I, I, that's just so satisfying to hear that. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And I will I will be online tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. I forget exactly what the topic is right now. But <laughs> you've got the email. <laughs> I'll look at the email before nine o'clock and make sure um, I do the right thing. Dave, what's your email address? Ah, let me put that in the chat tool. Thank you. I don't think I did that today. D Gibber so no in at sdccd.edu. There it is in the, at the bottom of the chat tool. Remember to save the chat tool before you leave. Ch save the chat log so you have all of that. But here, I, I think I have it on a Word document here too, so you can see it a little better. That's me right there. And I'm always happy to hear from you. And I'm getting a lot of email right now. Dave, I have um, one last question. How do we take in, how do we take in, um, download the chat transcript? Ah, um, look, are you looking at the chat box, yes. the chat window? Yes. Look in the lower right hand corner. There's three little dots, uh, right? Uh, three little dots down there. That's a menu. Right. Um, click on that and a, an option to save chat pops up. Right. So, but how do we go back to that? Where is it saving how, it to? Next question is where is it putting it, right? And how do you get it? Okay. Are you on a PC or a Mac? Um, I'm on a Mac right now. Oh. I can't exactly show you the finder. I'm on a, on a PC, but it's pretty much the same. You right. go to your finder, which is like my Windows Explorer is the closest thing to the finder on the PC. And you look for your default document folder. And I'm not sure exactly. It depends on how you have your Mac set up, but it, this should be in a document, in a, in a main document folder. Then look for another a, a subfolder called Zoom. Okay. Or you may just find that floating around somewhere in your uh, Finder list of folders, but it'll be there somewhere. And that's created automatically when you save something from Zoom. You don't have to make that. So open up that Zoom folder, and there'll be a subfolder under that that has today's meeting stuff in it. Hopefully you won't have that many Zoom recordings in your Zoom folder. But like here's tonight's meeting. That I know that's tonight's meeting because it was three uh, March 24th, 2020, and it started at um, about 1800 hours, about six o'clock PM. So the, that's how you find the right one. You open up that folder and there's your meeting saved chat.txt. That's your chat log. And to open it up, you should just be able to double click it and either Windows or Mac OS will know that that's a text file and will open it in either Notepad or what is it, text edit on the Mac, I think. Right. Just double click it and bang, there it is. That's Perfect. quite a chat file. It worked, I did it. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> and so, on that note, Dave, where would the um, where would the video be? In the same place? In the same, same folder? folder? Yeah, okay. I haven't saved. I haven't this. The video won't be in this folder until I stop this meeting. But the right. one, okay. the one, uh, this is the one I did this morning. Uh, it started at nine, just after nine o'clock. If I open that folder up, this one has the chat log in it and um but here's the video file it's always called zoom underscore zero so the, the the chat the transcript video. and the video will be in the same folder correct 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 okay. Okay. along with the sound along with the sound file mm -hmm. 
Uh, so the only ones you really need to worry about are the video file and the, the chat. This is the meeting. This is the file you created when you manually saved the chat tool. Chat.txt is the full chat log, I think. Yeah. Well, no, that's not. That's interesting. What would happen there? Here's the full one, I guess. Yep, that's it. Oh, no, they're the same. They're the same because I saved this. So chat.txt is the full one that's saved automatically when you record the meeting. This is the one you save manually. In this case, mine are the same because I saved the meeting. I saved the chat log manually just before I left the meeting, just in case. I usually do that. But anyway, both of those will both of those will have your chat log in. And you can always get them back. And somebody asked me the other day, do you ever delete this off your machine? No, <laughs> because I want to keep these in case I need them later. In case something happens to the copy I've got online or there's a question about it or something, I save these forever. And I periodically back them up to an external hard drive. Excellent. <laughs> Anything else? No, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. You're, thank you're so Dave. welcome. Thank you for attending. And good, good night. night. Have a great, good night. great time tomorrow. And let me know how it goes. And let me know if you have questions. I'll thank look you. forward to hearing. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.